Shinji and Warhammer 40k chapter 18. Don't cry for me. Tokyo 3 part 2. I have been told by Twitter that if you do claps in between each word, you get a lot of attention. Bright colours lit up the sky above old Tokyo. Two great shapes plummeted out from the blazing display, limbs flailing. The air seemed to shimmer and the two massive humanoid shapes righted themselves. Vom! Unit 1 slammed into the ground, winding down like a coiled spring, sending a shower of rocky splinters out. A small dust cloud formed around it, reinforced concrete crushed to powder. Slowly it stood up and pulled its ankles out from being embedded. Vom! Unit 2 landed forcefully nearby. Its bones couldn't shatter so easily, but neither could such massive shock be ignored. That Ava let out a low grumble as it slowly shifted to a more stable stance. Its fingers twitched, its four eyes glowed with anger. The jet alone and JSSDF representatives gulped in fear, resisting the urge to flee as the two Evangelions loomed threateningly over them. A different kind of roar filled the air. The two matte black VTOL carriers, henceforth to be referred to as the Hotaru or Firefly class carriers, each landed in front of their respective Ava. The side doors opened. From one emerged Misato Katsuragi and Ritsuko Akagi. Their hair was mussed, their walk unsteady. <sighs> said Misato while rubbing her eyes. That was too close! Even Ritsuko looked ready to murder someone. If we were just a fraction of a second too late, we could have been killed. Someone needs to suffer for this. Both women looked up and very deliberately stalked over to the gathered welcoming committee. The men all felt rooted to their spots, helpless before their impending doom. Since the last time they were around, they planned to be more welcoming, giving that assisting nerve made up the bulk of their allocated funding. In retrospect, firing welcome missiles at those who had simply too many enemies and were making more by the minute could only backfire horribly. Rei Ayanami and Maya Buki stepped out from the other carrier. They looked far more composed. Were you afraid, Sister Ibuki? The girl whispered aside. Ah, oh, please! After what we've been doing, as long as you're with me, nothing short of a nuke would phrase me. The young woman replied, waving disdainfully at the idea. We still have a lot of the work left to do. I am deeply touched by your faith in me, Sister Ibuki. She bowed slightly. As long as Shinji-kun needs us, let us just refuse to die. Yes, of course. She paused. The rotors were still turning and whistling. Why are we whispering? She asked. It was mostly by their contact communication that they could even hear each other anyway. So I do not need to defend us from snipers and militant psychologists. Oh. Misato had already locked onto and seized the jet alone at representative. You ass! She shouted into his face. What the hell did you think you were doing? We could have been killed! <coughs> what are you talking about? He replied, while being shook about like a rag doll. It's just fireworks! More colourful pattern explosions happened above old Tokyo. Yes, those were real missiles with real seekers, the visitors knew. The JSSDF could afford to just waste them in firing at an Ava. It wasn't as if their weapons were proving to be of any use anyway. Leaving aside the hideous expense of stuffing missiles with such childish warheads and setting them off. Seriously, how much more money did they throw at you that we could have used the nerve? Growled Ritsuko, her glasses glinting dangerously. If we'd raised the AT field, two things could have happened. She held a finger up. The first, our aircraft could have been destroyed in a variety of ways. From being crushed by the AT field, changes in air pressure, or being hit by an inert but still at max speed, projectile. She then held up the index of, our, of her other hand. The second. In thinking we were being attacked, we could have just raised this place to the ground in a second. You don't think that's possible? She jabbed at him with both fingers up his nose. Who the hell do you think we are? Nerve knows the power of her logic. Um, let's go. Do you even still live in the same reality? Such reckless, dangerous behaviour. You're infringing on our monopoly. 
The scientist took out her digits, wiped them on his expensive pinstripe suit and looked up at the avas blocking the sky. She feared being seen as useless by Gendo and hated her emotional dependency. But not until then had she realised there was such a variety of other and stupid ways for her to die. She began to cackle madly. Now look what you've done, said Misato, letting go of the man. You broke Ritsuko! I hope you're happy, she chided. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. He clapped his palms together and put his hands up over his head, as if fearing she might strike out at him. He had the deepest respect for Katsuragi, who after all had been brave enough to crawl into an unstable nuclear reactor to shut it down by hand. I'm just a messenger! Don't shoot the messenger! Uh, well, how am I supposed to put that crazy blonde back together? Give me some dye and maybe we can wash some IQ back in. Ritsuko abruptly stopped laughing. She groaned out and palmed her face. Masato, shut up. Just shut up. She sighed and smoothed out the folds of her dress. It just struck me that I can't picture what Gendo's reaction would be if he was there with us. It would be almost worth it to see him be in a situation he had no control over. Masato tried to picture it, but couldn't. Those around couldn't help but to try. They failed. Whatever it was, it should be unpleasant. Just how so was unimaginable. Well, in any case, please, let us offer our apologies. The J.A. rep and all others there bowed deeply. From among those gathered there, a general moved forward. He took off his hat and exposed his shaven head to the air. That smoothness seemed to shine under the hot sun. Everyone squinted at his approach. No, if anyone's to blame, it should be me said General Akira. He put his cap to his chest and bowed. I assure you we meant no harm. Of course you didn't, replied Masato, smirking. You wanted to see our air capabilities too, didn't you? The Evangelion might be powerful, but if it has to walk to the battle, then it could run out of power before doing anything useful. The delivery system does seem to be an obvious flaw in the Evangelion as a weapon system. Ritzko added. As it is, the Ava is a purely defensive measure. The carriers themselves can't avoid conventional attacks. Right, you know that now. Satisfied, General? Yes. Please accept our apologies, Captain Katsuragi. That was such vast comfort. The JSSDF, like the members of Jet alone, also had a degree of leftover resentment for Nerve. They wanted a ha! in your face moment to cut that wildly successful behemoth down to size to keep them from becoming too arrogant and secure in their power. The display, childish as it may have been, was giving in to that last temptation. Pop, wine, sparkle. The fireworks were less impressive during the day, but it lent a surreal atmosphere to the afternoon anyway. Shall we head on in? asked the J.A. representative. As soon as the pilots join us, we can begin our demonstration of the new technologies available to the Ava. Nerve didn't exist in a vacuum. It did produce its own power and had underground facilities for the maintenance of the Evangelions, but it still required a bevy of goods and services from the outside. At the same time, not everything that it produced was allocated for its populace. Research, products and manpower also flowed back out to serve the nation. In another time, Jet Alone and its parent company would have been just a footnote in the emerging final history of man. Its self-destruction was complete once its fatal flaws were revealed. Gendo and Nerve appropriated whatever loose assets it had for their use. Shinji Akari's words changed that. Now these men and women were eager to display their own worth, to test themselves against Nerve again. They rated with bated breath their reactions, and to be known as not merely as discarded second stringers, but as major players in the game. But first, introductions. Politeness was never out of style. Their overblown arrogance during the last test worked against them, hastening their fall. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shiro Tokita, project director, and in the name of New Nippon Heavy Industry Solidarity, welcome. May I introduce our most honoured guests, gesturing to each one, Rei Ayanami, Shinji Akari, Asuka Langley Soyu, Captain Misato Kataragi, Dr. Ritsuko Akagi, Lieutenant Maya Ibuki. He then turned to the other group. Makoto and the pilot slouched, depressed. They weren't even worth mentioning. Such was the fate of the throwaway secondary cast, was their thought. 
Not that they begrudged the others their spotlight, as they also knew the keen expectations of those in the front lines. Those left unseen are often also protected by their anonymity. It was still sad, though, to be treated like a mass of minions. Sometimes I think I might even forget my own name, muttered one of the pilots. Chairman Akito Kusu of the NNHIS is here on behalf of the board members. From the JSSDF, we are likewise honoured to receive General Kiyosato Akira, General Ryo Minara and General Sakata Asagiri. They all bowed to each other. It felt like opponents measuring each other. They were inside one of the massive hangars set up in a bulldozed plane in old Tokyo. It was an old airport, but they had to add even more open space still. If anything, the old buildings made for convenient targets for prototype weapon tests. The Jet Alone project was intended as a cost-effective alternative to the Evangelion project. However, Shinji Ikari and Principio Eternus proved conclusively how flawed and insufficient it was for the challenges ahead. Jet Alone was crushed. We were already in the middle of constructing the first production model. Many billions were sunk into the project. Years of development. Careers and reputations were at stake. The angels attacked and things were still incomplete. Jet Alone was on the verge of total collapse. And it did collapse. The project died a sudden and unlamented death shouted out Project Presenter Takita with perhaps too much enthusiasm. He lifted his mic up and all the workers and technicians watching cheered. He paced around with wide, swinging steps. Oi, said General Asagiri to the rotund industrial magnet. Is this all right? He's acting like it's something great. I'm sure you people lost money on this. Why is he behaving like a rock star or televangelist from the last century? It's fine, replied Chairman Kuso. He did say he reached an epiphany a day after that, while sitting alone in the cemetery above his father's tombstone. But really, you'll see. This is good business for all of us. Jet Alone was discontinued. The parent cooperative, NHIS, instead signed up for an industrial agreement with Nerve. We will produce weapons and assorted parts for the Evangelion at fixed rates for a preparatory stockpile. It wouldn't make up the losses and not nearly as much as what we expected to make from a successful project, but it would let us survive as a business for a little while longer. We in NHIS, in HIS, have produced weapons and parts that proved crucial in the battles that came later. He pointed over to the specific products put up to display. First off, the expanded battery pack. EPX4 in his name. Pauldron power module. The Ava in the umbilical power cable has a feed of around 88 minutes out of the capacitors under Tokyo 3. Pauldron Mark 1 gives only 15 minutes of operational freedom, but in our Mark 4, we may extend that up to an hour. As requested, the secondary modules are to be carried on the shoulders, where it was most convenient and would not unbalance the Ava. Then, we have the Evangelion armor casting, in his name, Fear Invictus armor module. These secondary armoring are what forms the F-type equipment. As you can see, it adds greater protection to the joints and angled armor of the critical chest area. The neck regions of the entry plug have been reinforced appropriately, with shock dampener systems added. And, most importantly, the weapons. Evangelion armaments, in his names, Great Bolter, Heavy Great Bolter, Custom Cannon, Doombringer Rockets, Prog Javelin, Prog Spear, Prog Bayonet, Prog Chainsword. Ooh, wafted through the structure. The sight never failed to inspire awe. Even Oscar wanted one. After all, it was a weapon composed of several thousand biting and vibrating blades, meant for ripping and tearing through nearly anything and as tall as a medium-sized building. Yes, yes. Nerve went over our designs and every one of our products with every eye to finding fault, and found none. He nodded in self-satisfaction. No offence meant, but you people need to focus on your Evangelions. When it comes to building weapons, you just don't have nearly the same expertise or acuity. Masano raised her hand. Hey, no complaints here. It's not like we actually need to pay for that stuff. The UN just delivers them and we have the option of sending it back. So far, they had not. He grinned. Our weapons have served you well, 
He gestured to Ray. Pilot Ayanami has long-range fire support. The positron rifle you use in his name is the Big Shooter, for it's nothing more than a modded version of the Nerve positron rifle with improved power cells and cooling. How do you find it so far? It is sufficient. He nodded, but just not good enough. The JSSDF positron cannon is the only pure human wep weapon that proved capable of taking out an angel. Dad gave others hope of mounting a fortified defence against the threat. Without an AT field, there is no defence, Ray replied flatly. An emplaced cannon as such may have only one chance before it is ruined. And therefore wasting millions upon millions, and all that time and manpower. Yes, we here in his service believe that the Ava's potential could be expanded even more with the proper equipment. For you we give... The first human-made, high-power, heavy-pack, positron Ava sniper cannon. Thump! The lights went on over a massive, tarp-covered flatbed. The covering was dragged away by small forklifts below to reveal a folded-up cannon with two simply immense barrels. It stood beside what looked to be an Ava-sized backpack. Tokida continued. We still haven't figured out what, in his name, to give it. Dual-packed positron beams and a cyclic capacitor. That right there is a miniature nuclear reactor. Don't worry, it's much safer than the one in Jetalo. As a ranged combat multiplier, the risk of malfunction is less, but even then just dropping the reactor pack should be easy enough. How safe is safe? asked Ritsuko. Shielding's been doubled, and power generation relies upon a continued signal. At the loss of that signal, it automatically shuts down. He grinned. What do you think, Miss Ayanami? Does double buster rifle sound good to you? The girl looked down. She took a single step to the left and just barely touched her hand to Shinji's. Everyone looked on curiously. Despite the simplicity of that motion, it still looked somehow very intimate. It had the expected effect upon Asuka, to prod her further with the hint of deeper secrets and making her long for that same sort of unashamed connection. Two barrels, one for Gork, one for Mork, said Ray in the unity of their souls. Did you have anything to do with this? I might have made a passing comment to someone who repeated it to other people, who then put it to a few who needed ideas. Thank you. You are too kind to me. I didn't really have that much to do with it. A small smile crossed his lips. Whatever makes you happy, makes me happy. Thank you, said Ray, louder. Thank you for giving me... The Moonbiter. In his name, the Gargant... Moonbiter. Shiro Takita nodded. Thank you, it fits real. There's a really an upper limit to how much power we can feed into this, as long as this discharges. Hey, why not? If we pump it up enough, we just might scratch at the moon. Ritiko leaned over the railings of the raised platform they were in. It was actually on top of a truck, and they moved from site to site on the mammoth hangar. So this is what you wanted to show us. Interesting. I'm not certain of its ability to penetrate an AT field, but I can already tell it would cause massive damage to an angel if the other Abus can neutralise the field. No, not really, was the careless reply. What? There's more? Indeed, Captain Katsuragi, said General Minara, leaning on his cane. The old man looked grimly amused. Get alone is dead. But we threw into this thing more than what we cared to spend on that in the first place. She chuckled back. As a weapon against the Evangelians, you mean? Nerf cannot hold on to the Evers forever, Captain Katsuragi. It must either be a weapon for the sake of the world, or be made utterly useless. It will be ours, or no one's. The observation mini tower moved on. Soon enough, they stopped in front of two great doors. Slowly, that section of the complex opened up. Lights only lit up a small portion of the hangar over a larger observation deck. They all got out and took an elevator up to it. Shiro Tokita spun his microphone in his hand. The long-faced, prematurely balding man was not a scientist or a technician, more of a corporate climber. However, he looked more eager than anyone else there. It was as if he absorbed the dreams of their project into himself, and as such was the very linchpin holding all the different people's interests and priorities into one determined whole. Waiting there was one of the division engineers, the project design chief, engineer Saito Hibana. The appropriate introductions were made. 
As soon as that was done, the presenter moved away to the edge of the raised deck to face the darkness. A minute or so passed in silence. Well? asked Miss Atmato impatiently. He let out a sigh. Do you mind if I say something here? It's a bit personal, but I need to get it off my chest. She looked to the generals, then to the Inez chairman. They seemed willing to take cues from her. She shrugged. Eh, sure. Knock yourself out. Thank you. Jet alone was the culmination of decades of effort. From the combination of many of this country's top minds and top engineers, we thought of something that should have been able to dominate the theatres of Raw for at least 20 years. We staked so much on it. It held the pride of this nation, and we thought perhaps of all humanity itself, a purely human-built weapon against forces from beyond the sky. And we were wrong. Like a thunderclap appears the Evangelion and Shinji Akari out of nowhere, and in one easy motion undoes all that effort. Can you imagine how damning that was? How galling? How much it insulted everything we've ever done so far? Sure we can, muttered Asuka. Damn invincible Shinji! We hated it. We hated you, Mr. Carey. You, your father, everything you stood for. But in the end, we hated ourselves the most. We were just wrong. We built it for all the wrong reasons. We were too arrogant and greedy, and the Ava was just that inherently better. We needed a serious slap in the face to see that. Principio Eternus demolished Jet alone. Those were dark days after that. We were all shocked and stunned. It seemed like everything was at an end. Our world was ending. Our jobs were in dire peril. Where else would we go? Nerve already has all the best that they needed. We didn't think we could bear being part of that. The shame would be too much. He took a deep breath and chuckled. He had to say it. He needed them to know just from what uncertain depths they'd clawed their way out of. They had their own strength, their own true pride, and they could look at Nerve without cringing. I was afraid. Very afraid. I'm a businessman, a manager, and when it all comes down to it, I saw I had very little useful skills. I stood high with Jet alone, and once that was gone I had nothing. As one of the face men in the project, telling about how great and unstoppable it was, no one else would take me in at risk of tainting their own little projects. I had mud on my face. I was a disgrace. My wife and my child. They tried to cheer me up, but I couldn't see any way it could possibly be better. After living the good life so long, I didn't know how to deal with losing it all. An executive like me? What else is there? I can't go back to doing menial work. That was what I thought. It was so dark. I wanted it to end. It wasn't just a few of us that contemplated suicide, added Chief Engineer Habana. You need to understand, we wasted all that time and effort. Our product couldn't even put up a decent challenge to the Eva, and against the Angels it was just a toy. Our shame was absolute. We lost too much face. So what? asked Asuka, revealing her unfamiliarity with that Asian concept. It's just work. Just get up and move on. Project Director Takita sniffed haughtily. What is work? Without rages, that's just slavery. Without pride, that's just servitude. Miss Sue, you think of it this way. You're an Evangelion pilot. Do you think once the war is over and the Avers aren't needed anymore, could you be satisfied with just flipping burgers on a hot grill somewhere or saying welcome to department store customers? happen. I've got plenty of talents besides that. But what if all the good people saw you for was in piloting? And without an Ava they wouldn't have a use for you. Turn away from you. And what would you do? She flinched. That struck a little too close to her fears. She gave up too much for the sake of being the best in the Ava. I wasn't fired. Not yet. I knew it was inevitable. Jed alone was dead and Nerve was picking at its remains. I didn't want to see that. We couldn't recoup our losses just by making assorted spare parts. All that research and development. That was a damn expensive undertaking. It's more than just a competition. It's a way of life. We failed at life. I went over to my father's grave. The old man died before impact. He wasn't like me. He was an architect and he liked to get his hands dirty. I wanted to be rich. I chose to tread the path of a salary man. And after impact fought without scruples to get up the business ladder. He died of just old age. 
Most of the houses he had built are underwater now. In the end, we were both just failures, weren't we? But the thing is, at least he did something. He made it his life's work to preserve people's happiness. He made things for others' sake, not cashing in on tragedy. The most important thing I remember, though, was that the old man never gambled. Not with money. Not with his family. He didn't leave it up to school and TV. He made sure to be there to raise me right. I had ambition, because he was there to say that it's alright to hope for the future. The best things in life are those you could just reach out and take. I was gambling on Jet Alone. I was gambling on humanity's future. Just for money, I was ready to back something half done and risking myself and my family and all that I knew. We let the pressure get to us. We had to show something to the public. We were doing more than wasting away time and money. We lived a high life in that white elephant of a project. We played on the inherent suspicion of outsiders, of the UN and Nerve. This is our country. How dare they imply we were incapable of defending our homeland? What could they really know? But it's more than just this place. More than just Japan. More than just the world. I stood there over my father's grave and I felt like a hand on my shoulder. I heard a voice whisper. It wasn't the end. As long as I was alive, I could do something. As long as there was still time, there was still chance. I had to believe if I wanted things to get better. I had to do if I wanted to live. That was my moment of epiphany. I had nothing else but hope, and nothing else to give but hope. When I returned that night, my wife handed to me a package delivered from certain anonymous benefactors. In it, I saw the reason to continue. He took a deep breath and willed back the urge to glance at the young Ikari. More than just his recommendation to the JSSDF, they all owed the boy plenty. The ideas they received, Ivory had Nerve's think tank behind him, unlikely, else they would have just built the things themselves, no need for secrecy. Or the boy came up with these strange but compelling notions on his own. This man went around, pulling back everyone in the Jet Alone build team. So what if the project was dead and we were stuck with building add-ons for the Ava? If that was the last, best hope for humanity, then we could still be the best at what we do. As long as we did was to make things possible for the rest of you. The former JA engineer laughed. You know, a lot of us tried to take a swing at it. He sucked us into Jet Alone and promised us everything. And he was trying it again. But one by one, we went back to work. We could hardly believe it. We couldn't even believe he was the same man we knew. Really? You were kind of an ass back then. No need to mince words. I was an arrogant, selfish bastard. I wanted everything for nothing. He looked over the chairman, Kalsu. You know, a high annual income doesn't seem to matter much now if it turns out we won't last a year. (laughs) <laughs> Making weapons for the Ava was like grunt work, unimaginative and repetitive. It wasn't until the proposal for a chainsaw that things began to get interesting. Because seriously, it's a fucking massive chainsaw that you can swing around like a sword. How can anyone refuse to get excited by that? Even the old generals had to nod in agreement. Asuka too. Shinji, strangely, did not. But then he already had a mini chainsaw of his own which he hid well away from Asuka. She already thought of him as enough of a psycho as it was. All men are boys, mumbled Masado, and boys are never too old for toys. We were jet alone. Sure, it may have failed, but we had to build that technology from the ground up. Nerve is unsurpassed in biological and cybernetic systems. When it comes to hard machinery, Japan's heavy industry is still king over this hill. We had to do something to put all that prior research to good use. Chief Engineer Hibana round up the threads of thought. Shiro Takita flicked his announcement mic on again. The Evangelion killed all our hopes for Jet Alone, he shouted out. Shinji Kari and Prince Boaternus demolished decades of effort. But that's all right. We were building toys when humanity needed weapons. We were after money when we needed to win. Victory means profit. That should be obvious enough. Really? No hard feelings? asked Misato. The data we got from Nerve just showed how far behind the curve we were. The Ava and Shinji Akari. We couldn't hope to beat it. 
so he decided to join our strength to it. He turned around and held his arm out towards the darkness. Everyone, behold! Line by line, large lamps lit up the locale. Far below were several large blocky shapes, placed along a white trace line, Aversite made out of thick metal in dark purple and garish green. Interestingly, letters and various symbols seemed to be traced out in glittering soul, silver and gold materials. Empty eye holes in a great metal mask seemed to glare up at them. Ava Type T Equipment, he declared, sweeping his arms out. In his name, the Titan Modules! Masato whispered. Sweet! Ritsuko groaned out. Now he's bound to get a transformation sequence. She put her palms over her eyes and shook her head from side to side. What is it I've done to deserve this? There was all that blatant playing God and experimenting upon the clones, but still, it was nothing compared to what Gendo had coming. It was like fate and poetic justice just keeps missing the target. Collateral destiny damage. Maya pulled on her immediate superior's blouse. Here, senpai! She already had ready several large dose pills of aspirin in a canteen of water. Thank you, Maya. Ritsuko was all too grateful. Maya was all too attentive. The nerve scientist and main conspirator doubted she could survive through the ever-increasing insanity if she didn't have her faithful assistant by her side. What the hell is this? asked Asuka. The... what we call here the Titanicus up. Adds armour even thicker than that of Type F equipment, and uses the much more reliable fusion reactor supposed to be on Jet Alone 2. Much of what used to be Jet Alone was repurposed here. Note the simplistic angles of armour protection, the grip lock points and the integrated weapons. This is supposed to bring Evangelion combat capabilities to an entirely new level. Engineer Hibana eagerly di dived into the discussion. Fix slabs of armour for brutal close combat. With the reactor, guaranteed five days of straight operation. Pull as much AT field magic as you want. Even if Nerve decides to use batteries instead, there's room for six extra pulled and power modules other than the two already on the shoulders. That's at least 15 hours of operation. Modularity. Always modularity. Jet alone was an inflexible machine. Shinji Akari-san was right. It would take too long to refit it to emerging situations. Just pick up. Slot in. We tried to make as many of our known technologies cross-compatible. We took out the new ultra-high frequency lasers, we called them turbo lasers, from the troublesome mounts on Jet Alone's arms and integrated into the shoulders. There are many weapon hardpoints, most on the braces and fire armor. Standard weapons loadout is... In his name, Hellstorm Gatling Megabolter right arm. In his name, Master Chainsword left arm. In his name, Titan Turbo Lasers, left and right shoulders. In his name, Titan Tornado, air mines on the back and left, right thighs. And of course, prog knives here and there. The hands remain free to wield whatever other weapons preferred by the pilot. Sure, it adds a lot of weight, but the list of now possible tactical opportunities just go on and on and on. The presenter nodded. In his usage of the Titan modules should extend not only in Ava's survivability, but its functionality. We made this according to exceedingly specific combat demands. Ah! Asuka screamed out and pointed angrily at him. Stop saying that! In his name this! In his name that! You're making it sound too... too... cultish! Shinji has enough demented followers as it is! Shiro Takita laughed. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just a coincidence. In his is purely secular, I assure you. Nonetheless, Doing that was an easy way to piss off Gendo. They of Jet alone knew it could only be sabotage. The elder Ikari was highest on a very short list of suspects. It was the younger Ikari who saved the project, even the lives of some very talented and easily depressed people. In his name they would build. In his name they would give. He turned to Shinji. Well, Ikari-san, do you approve? The pilot walked over to the edge for a better view. A winged skull was set into the front torso in gold-like metal. Upon the flat sides of the shoulder pads were etched large letters. The enemies of humanity will die, was emblazoned on the left. Its opposite proclaimed, by my hands they shall be broken. The front had a principio over the right chest plate, Eternus on the other. Cheekily, tiny and almost unseen, 
on the back was a license plate marked one Ikari one Tokyo free. Impressive, most impressive, he breathed out. Sir, this is Evangelion. Your new form awaits. May you be satisfied with this offering. May we defend humanity with this newfound power together. Awesome. Shiro Takita stood beside him, staring at the fruit of many months brainstorming and experimental construction, from scribbled lines on a page to the practical solution. Everyone worked so hard to make that fantasy into reality. More than just fighting the angels, it was his letter to the JSSDF that convinced many to continue supporting what used to be Jet Alone. From just weapons and batteries, slowly and inexorably they all clawed their way back into respectability. It could too easily have just ended up with the NHAIS torn apart by rapid corporate dogs. They'd earned that. All they needed was the opportunity to prove themselves and the will to try. Still, even the finest blade was worthless unless used. That was the entire point of a weapon, after all. The JA labs were very accommodating to his requests. Shiro Takita made it his responsibility to keep the exchange of packages between not beneath notice. He owed it to the boy. He simply couldn't imagine anyone else more worthy of those weapons. In his name, indeed. I thought so, replied the representative, nodding self-satisfied, jutting his chin out. But that's not all we have for you. It's not? Hey, what about me? Is that Type T equipment for my unit too? Unfortunately, Miss Suyu, since we cut apart JA2 for this, we only have one set of Titan modules. It should be cross-compatible among the Evangelions, but really so far we've designed it for use by Principio Eternus. Misano went over and slapped his back, overly friendly. Hey, yep, I knew there was something I liked about you guys when I first saw you. She put her right arm over his shoulder and leaned conspiratorially on him. How much is this going to set Nerve back? Nothing said General Akira. As per the terms of the industrial contract, it is the UN which decides production. Nerve only has the choice of accepting or rejecting the end product. It's already been paid for? commented Maya, running in her head the potential cost of such a thing. Billions at the very least. That sounds like too good of a deal, doesn't it? Yes, added General Minara hoarsely. For all we spent on this, the Emperor's new clothes just won't cut it. This uses the pieces of Jet alone. So what the hell have you been doing with our goddamn money? The men of Innes grinned. That was the surprise they'd been hoarding for so long. We promised the JSSDF something that they could use with the Ava. A weapon system that won't be so useless on the field as conventional arms just end up being. What could it be? Some form of super tank? A heavy cannon? Some new bomb? Just shut up and get to it, Tokira, grumbled the chairman. All right, follow me, everyone. All went over back into the observation vehicle. They crossed the length of the hangar over to the far doors marked exit. The truck stopped there. Once more, Tokita stepped up to declaim in the names of his fellows. Principio Eternus killed Jet alone, he shouted, grinning. From its ashes, we are reborn like a phoenix, like a flash of lightning inspiration strikes. We are no longer Jet alone, but we won't give up on our ideals. Humanity's own technology can stand against the angels. We can prove it. Bold words, said Ritsuko. Can you back them up unlike last time? Ever so slowly, the hangar doors opened, grinding and rumbling. Slivers of light seeped through the opening. Judge for yourselves. Jet alone is dead and gone. We give you Thunderbolt, Raiden Tactical, Trident. A strange block shadow moved across the space, blocking the light for a moment. The doors opened wider, revealing more and more of that shape. It was large, boxy, and painted bright rib robin blue. It bore proudly the skull and ring sigil on its chest, as in the Titan torso. An upright white omega symbol, bisected by an arrow like Neptune's symbol, was slapped onto its side. Trident! Land! Dreadnought! Whoomp! Whoomp! On thick, stubby legs it walked. Its left arm ended in a cylindrical bracer and claw assembly. In place of its right arm, it had a megabolter module. The six barrels spun wildly. 
and Daka. Daka, 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 Daka. Everything lit up for a few moments as the Trident Land Dreadnought unloaded a simply earth-shaking volume of fire into a prepared target towering nearby. That skyscraper-sized solid column of steel mesh and concrete blew apart with such astonishing ease. The new weapons platform ran forward, its stunted stature capable of moving with surprising speed. It made a short hop, slamming into what remained of the column. Weighing in the same as an Ava, nothing could stop that much momentum. Powder. Clouds of dust. It dug its squat flat toes into the ground to stop, carving up the highway as it tried to slow down. Project T. The Titan Modules. And the Trident Land Dreadnought. Much more robust and much simpler than the jet alone. It uses a compact fusion reactor and has armor fitness three times that of the Ava on its glasses pay. Modularity, as always... This is humanity's tireless servant, its workhorse of unnatural warfare. There was nothing elegant or complicated about the thing, just thick slabs of metal and reinforced joints. By comparison, Jet alone was graceful. The Evangelians were known for speed and brutality. This was meant not to defeat angels, but just to hold out stubbornly until the Avers could finish the job. Against conventional forces, it was just overkill. Land Dreadnought was no exaggeration. Once the ammo was exhausted, the bin dropped out of the cannon module. It walked over to a heap of large ammo containers and moved maneuvered to above it. From the open ammo field lowered an electromagnet suspended on thick steel cables. It clamped on a large box and pulled it up. Adjusting the drawer automatically, the crate then locked into place. A panel within opened and fresh rounds were brought up to the six barrel assault cannon. The ammo could be mega bulk rounds or solid AP slugs. The process of rearming, though the trident had no hands, took only slightly more than a minute. It was an inspiring sight. None of the Ava's curves, none of its sleek ease of motion. It swayed from side to side, leaving crushed gravel and deep footprints in its wake. It was indeed humanity's own. Until it reached where the two Ava's were standing, and revealed itself to be at most waist high to the other mech. It's like a puppy, Masato had to say. Like a deranged homicidal puppy. It alternated, pulling its weight from one leg to the other, raving its arm about as if doing a strange little dance. The dreadnought was all hard angles, and there was something rather endearing about it. Solid, compact, and dependable. Masato's offhand comment was the closest she could come to that reassuring feeling in seeing that thing. This is humanity's philosophy. Ugly, hastily put together, but it works, Takita shot back. This, more than the Ava, is a war machine. It's logistically sound and reliable under all situations. It works really, really well. It works even better than it should, actually. What about the AT field? asked Asuka, unwilling to give ground even a little bit from her Ava's own awesomeness. That's your problem. Without that, even this might be able to take down an angel or two. Vulcan Megabolter. Positron Cannon hard-mounted into the left torso. Missile Launchers. Hellbridge Superflamer. I'm not ashamed to say that we all intended for this to hold the line until Nerve can get going. Ugh! exclaimed General Asagiri. So this is what's got the Prime Minister all excited. This is to be put under JSS Def Yef Control. Ha! I approve! Can you mass-produce this design? It depends on what you mean by mass-produce, answered Chairman Kosu. We can assemble another one in a year or so. The most complicated part is a safe nuclear core for close combat weapon. Everything else, really. As long as the reactor is intact, we can keep rebuilding it from whatever battle damage it takes. Right? Indeed, said Tokita. For this war and beyond, the land dreadnought is a paradigm shift in the order of battle. I assume this one isn't remotely pilot like Jet alone, Ritzko noted. Due to the number of weapon systems we put in, that's no longer possible, replied Engineer Habana. Granted, there is the risk, but what use is a weapon that goes out of control and turns on its owners? Miss Sara raised her hand. We don't do that anymore. Well, it looks like you've learned from your mistakes, added Ritzko, ignoring that. 
Instead of having a complicated auto balancer, you just lowered the centre of gravity. Those mechanical joints should be able to deliver more power than the old flexible limbs. Such a simplistic solution. It deserves points for merit. With the angels coming in all shapes and sizes, having a platform that's harder to topple is far more practical than trying to keep pace with the Ava. The humanoid pace is your expertise, Dr. Akagi. However, as we found out with Jet Alone, there just isn't enough space for all the systems we wanted in that. The Ava is just more efficient. The AT feels impossible without certain biological components. We don't even want the AT field anymore. It sucks up too much power and makes the Ava extremely hard to repair. As I've said, learning from your mistakes. Innes just didn't have the background to compete against Nerve, as UN funds would always be more readily available than the pooled assets of a conglomerate. Repair costs alone could swallow the entire Jet Alone project. However, in the case of the Trident project, its brute quality was key. There was no functional difference between its left or right leg, right or left arms, merely the way they were socketed in. In comparison, an Ava needed much detailed effort in rebuilding long lost limbs. As a complete analogue of a human, its parts were not so interchangeable. Efficient? In battle, yes, but expensive as hell to maintain. The last best hope was just that. Failure was not an option under such strained circumstances. Am I correct in assuming it has a crew of commander, gunner and driver? Or is there more to it than that? Ritzko continued. No, that's pretty much it. It's not that difficult to handle. No sync ratios. No power-up sequences. Just switch on and it's ready to roll. Or as the technicians would say, push button, kick ass. Masada raised her hand again. Do you already have pilots? Crew? Yes, Captain Katsuragi. May we meet them? Of course. Let me get them on radio. Takeda went over to a call box propped up on the moving platform. He opened up a channel to the dreadnought. Oh, it seems the commander's already on the way. As this is just a demonstration, driver and gunner are enough to handle the machine. A few minutes later, a jeep arrived. Footsteps on the aluminium frame. Shinji had no need to turn around to know who it was. Hello, Mana, he said. Hello, Shinji-san, she replied, smiling faintly at his back. What? Asuka agitatedly swung about again. What's this hole? I knew there had to be some ulterior motive to all that hanging around Baka, Shinji. You again? Ray and Asuka clashed at an unseen level due to being such contrasting personalities, and Ray's occasional need to examine the concept of human fervour by poking at her subtly until she just explodes. The two girls had reached a certain understanding, though. They could actually call each other friends. Mana, however, was supremely irritating to Asuka, and actually could see just how much they were alike. Is it really that much of a surprise, Poilet see you? She shrugged, and followed Ray's cue to nod in familiar greetings. Not really, I guess. I know the reason why only we can pilot the Ava. Having others are contemporaries in another battle machine just seems... convenient, somehow. She looked at the other girl, standing there so primly. So what? Are we rivals now or something? Have we ever been anything but? Mana replied thinly. There is truth there, pilot, so you. The three girls considered each other. Those around them looked on amused at the shift in the scene. So it is true. Those not from Nerve. There was indeed such entertainment around the carry. It's like some form of Evangelion dating sim, with angels winning the least worry among all the bad ends. <laughs> Could he actually reach the best end? Shinji Akari-san. Hmm? Yes? The pilot turned away from the site. He was the only one who knew just how stubbornly tough the dreadnought could be. He hadn't been expecting that, though. When he sent over the drawings and the wooden model, he only had in mind that they could make a medium-scale combat platform, like oversized power armour, as a holding force inside the limited terrain of the geofront and its tunnels. If it meets your approval, we still haven't in his named it. Could you give one to our Trident Land dreadnought? asked Tokita. Is the Trident already a proper name? Maya pointed out. No, that's just the general project designation. A chassis mark, if you will. Just like Unit 1 is also Principio Eternus, so do we need a recognisable standard. Wouldn't a commander be the best choice for that? Or let it just be earned later on out of combat? Why me? Why not? It's your di- 
Oh, so that's a warning look. Interesting. How could narrowing the eyelids just a fraction cause so much sudden dread? Prerogative. Kirishima has decided to rave that right over to you. Frankly, it would be better than whatever pithy nickname the press could come up with later. Well, in that case, he turned towards Manor. Maybe we should... He stopped and stared intently at her, his face dumbstruck. Wow, Manor, is, is that your dress uniform? She blushed and stared down. It didn't seem much. Black was a very basic colour, and the suit worn inside the dreadnought was nothing more than a derivative of military fatigues. For simplicity's sake, her dress uniform was a simple long coat with golden filigree. As long as it was kept pristine, she could look sharp even after hours spent inside a cramped compartment. She eeped as Shinji suddenly lunged for her breasts. However, he just buttoned up her outer jacket up to the neck. He looked ecstatic for some reason. Do you have a hat? he asked. Mana shook her head, and Shinji moved aside to grab at a general's hat. Excuse me, he said to General Akira. While Mana was still struck by the impropriety of it all, he smoothed her hair out and put it over her head. He pulled the brim down to cover her eyes slightly. By the Emperor, he exclaimed. He put his hands on her shoulders and began to turn her slightly from side to side. You're perfect, Commissar Kirishima. Triumphant bells began to ring in her hearing. Behind them, four females from Nerve began to frown mightily. Ritsuko just sighed. Too much insanity in the air. Promote her, General Akira whispered to Asagiri. Promote her now. Why? We don't even have that rank. Didn't you hear? By the Emperor. That's how our new constitution starts. That's also the opening line in a formal request. Besides... Even if we don't, the Russians do. If, and more like Ren, they get rid of this, they'll give her an honorary commission just to piss us off. We did side with China in the Second Manchurian Conflict, added General Minara. The NRSSF would be gloating about not waiting until we tried to steal even that from them. Mainline bastards threw us out anyway. All right. Shinji kept his hands on her shoulders. He grinned. It was just too perfect. Mana. The Dreadnought's machine spirit needs a name. It needs to know itself. But are you ready to live in its light? Can you lock your will to this deadly purpose? I'm ready to fight for you, sir, she said softly. So he leaned over, uncaring of how it may look and all the danger Ikari Shinji danger instincts all going off at once. He whispered in her ear, Then listen well. Believe in Mana Kirishima. Let your heart be as steel, and forever shall shine the name. Unseal its might upon the enemies of man. In its name, fight. Awaken! Magnus Tancred! The girl said under her breath. Oi, we're getting a power fluctuation here, said Kater. Did you try to override the cyclic timing of the capacitor again? It wasn't me. I did nothing. You can't prove anything. The other teen raised his hands high away from the weapons console. He looked up towards his friend sitting on the command chair. Sashi? No, I didn't do anything. Stop aiming at Ikari. It's good thing I have control over weapon safety here. You do know that precision at the sheer size of our guns is impossible at such scales, right? You just vaporize manner along with the others. With great reluctance, a red dot drifted away from Shinji's forehead. Meanwhile, back in Tokyo 3, Kaji and Kaoru were off to a bit of breaking and entering. While they were away was the perfect time to snoop around inside the Katsuragi residence. Understandably, the spy was reluctant to participate in that. However, even as much as Gendo thought of people as disposable, even so much more did Seal Enforcer die slowly and painfully clause into those that know of its existence. He was a convenient tool, nothing more. The fact that a SEAL member could traipse on about Tokyo 3 without Gendo knowing about it was disturbing enough. Hey, if you want to know what Nerve is up to, why don't we, you know, just break in a Nerve? Ah, but Nerve is just a front for that interesting little family drama that is the Ikari Primetime Show, Kaoru replied cheerily. If you want to know what Gendo is planning, then you need not look any further than his son. 
I'm sure it will involve him sooner or later. Everyone else is just incidental to the issue. You're insane, you know that? Am I? Yes, you are. Am I really? Yes, you are. Kaoru shrugged. I guess I am crazy then. He gave Kazu another secretive grin. It's nothing more than what Tokyo Free demands. Come on, Mr. Ryuji. Let's go to work. <laughs> the spy flicked his cigarette away and clenched his fists, taking orders from a kid. The world was getting stranger by the minute. Not that Asuka was never bossy or that Shinji wasn't just creepy in his own way, but the pale-haired teen had all the signs of a developing murder artist. Helping the kid break into Masato's home? Not a good feeling. The skies in well-meaning questions were all the threat she would be harmed anyway if he failed to live up to his obligations. Kaoru would hardly hesitate. After all, she was also very important to the younger Ikari. Kaji was in the business long enough to know that no amount of vengeance can bring someone back. What about the guards and security cameras? he asked. We might get in on the presence that I'm visiting Masato or Asuka, but staying too long when we know they're not there will be suspicious. Do not worry about those today. That problem's already been... handled. They were waiting at an intersection for the pedestrian light to turn green. Karu seemed far too relaxed that day, as if to say, Surely do you don't think I'm here alone, do you? Kaji glanced aside meaningfully. Not permanently, the angel hybrid had added. We don't want to leave any trace of our presence. Green. Let's just get this over with. Sometimes I think I'm just too damn curious for my own good. They simply walked in. The place seemed empty. The building security guards were conspicuously absent, but in Tokyo 3 was a city that relied heavily on electronic forms of surveillance and protection. Very few, other than elected officials, were paid to just stand around in the off chance something important might happen. The Katsuragi apartment was barely more than unsecured, despite the importance of its occupants. The lock was very basic, and Kaji had no difficulty picking it open. Karu pulled at the door soft, slowly and stared into the apartment. So, this is Akari's castle, he thought. In many ways, it was more forbidding than stepping into Lilith's shell. The geofront was but a fading echo of an earlier age, and it was these Lilim that made new gods to walk the earth. What are you, a vampire or something? Kaji snarked while looking nervously around the empty hallway. Just go in so we can get this done already. Karu chuckled briefly. Apologies, Mr. Ryuji. He put one foot in. That was one small step for a hybrid. One giant leap for angel kind. He entered into the home. It was so ridiculously simple, he thought. Just leave a bomb and the way would be clear. It was all too easy, for they had not expected the enemy to wear the same form. Facing young Akari head-on was a futile effort, but there were many indirect means of attack. Lilim and their murderous ways, more dangerous to themselves than anything else. Except he didn't feel that would solve any of his problems. If anything, that should only make it worse, for only the role of the disciple is really necessary. It was a modest place, but surprising. Kaji wristled as he poked his head through the door. Masato never struck him as the sort of person with an eye for style, other than her own innate charm. It was all too clean, and the various furnishings were tasteful without being expensive. The arrangement of the furniture and wall decor seemed strange. Was that Feng Shui? Karu frowned the further he got into the hole. The air felt... itchy. Logically, he knew that he shouldn't feel too unwelcome. The young Akari didn't have any special powers outside of his nigh-unstoppable way Evangelion, and that strange symbiosis that Karawu could discern off the other angel hybrid. Impossibly, even Shinji, human by all measure, was starting to ping off his own angel radar. The reverse might apply. He needed to be careful. Kaoru Nagisa had never been injured only once, and that was from underestimating the stubborn cunning of weak humans. He knew how the other fought. Power easily gained is also easily taken away. It was that which made him formidable. His power was within the faith of those that followed him, not in relics or clever devices. Still, it all felt stifling. Some day they'd need to meet face to face. On that day, Kaoru needed to be the strongest he would ever be. Ah! Both intruders turned to see Pen Pen waddling over from behind the kitchen counters. 
The penguin stared up at them with darkly hostile eyes. He turned away from Kaji, as if dismissing him as unimportant, and focused on Kaoru. Pen Pen moved closer to bar their path. He exchanged glares with the half angel. Long claws at the tips of his wings twitched. Kaoru kicked out with his right foot and punted Pen Pen into a wall. <coughs> the penguin screeched as his rake left the floor. A small and unseen flash of light shone at the point of contact. Pen Pen slapped onto the separating boards, right under a painting of sailboats, and slid down unconscious. Kaoru smirked. Kaji shoved at his shoulder, making the team face him and grabbed at his shirt. What the hell do you think you're doing? The spy shouted to his face. That guardian animal could have been troublesome, was the calm reply. It should be just unconscious. No need to worry. What about not leaving a trace of our presence? You just kicked a penguin. Misato's penguin. He paused and looked at the slumped mass of black and white feathers. It's a penguin! He had to drive that point in. What's the worst he could do? Peck at their ankles so they'd slowly bleed to death? What's wrong with you? It's just an animal, Mr. Ryuji. What would you risk for an animal? Better now that it's out of our way now than following along as we inspect this place. Go and set your devices now, while no one can see where you may decide to place them. The pale-haired teen unclasped Kaji's fingers with deceptive strength and ease. It isn't dead. It's not as if I'm going around killing kittens for no reason. Do not bother me with trifles like this again. Boy, you better watch what you say. You don't want to see me get pissed off. You are Kaji Ryuji. You met Masato Katsuragi while in college. However, this was not due to coincidence. Her father was your mentor, and you felt you had a responsibility somehow to look after her. You're a special inspector for Nerve and the UN now, but playing each side against the other. People don't trust you, Mr. Ryuji. Not her. Not any more. And it's easy to see why. Over all that time, there were very few that you actually trusted in return. They don't believe you know now the meaning of loyalty. The only person that you concern yourself about is Masato Katsuragi. She told you to let go, and you did. She is too important to you. You don't have anyone else alive whom you believe would care if you disappeared. Believe me, Mr. Ryuji, having me pissed off is far worse than your little tantrums. Touch her and I'll kill you. Kill me, and she dies slowly. To be frank, right now I do not even need to harm her. All I need to do is tell her just what you've been up to in the years while you were separate. Kaji flinched and lost that round. Having little horrors like you makes me trust Seal less and less. Did you really trust Seal, ever? Karu shrugged heavily and turned away. What we do is unpleasant, but must be done. He ran a hand across the dining table in a strangely coy motion. I can help you, Mr. Ryuji. Help? <laughs> yeah, right. Your greater good isn't much good at all if you need to use threats just to get your way. The only difference between you and Gendo is that the bastard is even that much of a hypocrite. All must serve the greater good in their own way. It's the only logical option. There is no room for neutrality here. He thumped at the wood, like asking for good luck. Heroes should be unnecessary and martyrs a waste of potential. Threats stand to be far more limited in scope than the stupidity they seek to prevent. And Mr. Yuji, I do not ask for much. I know how this goes. Bankers shoving credit cards look so unreasonable and helpful, till the interest starts piling up. The spy rummaged around in his pockets for another cigarette, but didn't light it. What's your deal? That kind of strong arm protection I don't need. There's a reason your business is called Tradecraft, Mr. Yuji. Think of it as a system of equitable exchange. This is Tokyo Free. This is a Carrie's land. None other than us have the power and the resources to protect her from whatever plans he has. I would have you remember that the Evangelians would be nothing without our support. Ah, but who's going to protect her from you? Carol smirked. 
Think about this. Seal established nerve to prevent the angels from initiating third impact. Others are only offshoots to this idea. You are but one man. We are legion, and the masters of this fouled earth, and for a small service we will grant you what you so want. Do you see the logic? Reason dictates that only we can properly serve the greater good. Only with us can you prevail. Only we can change this world for the better. Kaji was silent. Kaoru had neglected to mention that one can be logical, and yet still so very wrong. One merely had to be fed false data. He took out a pocket camera. We have a job to do, Mr. Ryuji. Let us be done with it so we will not need to suffer any more of each other's company. Kaji grunted and went for Masado's room. Gendo and Nerve hadn't bugged the Katsuragi apartment for the simple reason that all those within were intentionally being kept in ignorance of the larger picture. Kaoru snapped picture after picture of the trim and well-maintained apartment. Kaoru went over to a door marked Shinji's Lovely Suite in Miss Sato's ironic handwriting. He hesitated there, and only after what seemed to be a supreme expression of will did he slide that door open. He didn't know what to expect. Prophecies were human inventions. Religion was as much a reflection of a certain person than as a system of beliefs. Such human notions tended to be self-perpetuating, immaterial ideas as the only thing in perpetual motion. The human half of him also needed to feed upon that legend. Shinji Akari had to be larger than life, for the defeat of his siblings in that way was a death notable even in its failure. Epic failure was epic nonetheless, and eternity was the cloak of the angels. He sighed as he saw the compact neatness of Shinji's room. A single bed, a single faux wood study table, a single study lamp, one cello case. The only things that Shinji had in multiples were books, pens and notebooks. It was all so sparse, monastic even. For all his tendency to bestow lavish gifts upon those he loved, he spent very little for his own comfort. Kaoru stayed in the penthouse suite of a hotel. Seal was unimaginably wealthy, might as well take advantage of that while he still could. In such lavish surroundings did the angel pursue his plans. He played the part of a spoiled, unattended heir well. He just so managed to impress Asuka by a simple date in that hotel restaurant. In the past few months they'd known each other, in space meetings made more precious by their uncertainty, he enticed her well. It was all about deception, like the pilot and he himself, hiding the truth of their power. Poking around Tokyo Free had revealed just how many vines the younger Akari had strangling around the city. Kaoru spent more time trying to uncover the subtle movements of the sun, rather than the overly ominous designs of the father. Seal could wait. In the end, manipulations, stolen, undeserved power would fade away, and only the one with a floating soul would matter. He stepped into the room. He felt a strange tingling. He looked around and saw on the study table four plastic figures. The half-angel pulled out the chair and sat down facing the four. He absently rang his fingers over Shinji's neat assortment of school books. School. Homework. Karu grit his teeth. Even such simple things were denied to him. He was born with full awareness of what he was and was by all definitions a genius. That was what Seal wanted. There was no choice in the matter. They tried to raise him as their tool. So, as I feared, he has them now. He stood over the four figurines and studied them. Just plastic and paint. Yet, these also carry the expressions of his soul and should bear the shadow of his existence. Anger welled up from within. He too had been so lonely. Whatever how other children had suffered, he believed he had endured greater. However alone Shinji and Rei could have been, his was much more so. The old men didn't want a controllable Ava pilot. They wanted an angel bound to their will, and got it. The moment he unsealed his AT field, he felt it. That great hollow within, that great wrongness. The urge to recover Adam was absolute. He would do anything to rid himself of that. As but a child, Rei died her first death. As but a child, he killed his first man. Seal wanted an absolutely unstoppable and untraceable assassin. They found it at him and his AT field. For Adam, he would do what they wanted. For the greater good. Plastic things. He did not know toys. They tried to get him attached to surrogate parents. 
He killed them for their deceit. Unlike Ray, who was a soul of patience, his every moment ached to return to Adam. More angel than human, yet trapped in his own flesh. He knew Seal, even as Ray was privy to Gendel's plans. He knew each of them, for he had served each in many disgusting ways. Angels had no need to ask why. The imperative was enough. Just to feel Adam nearby was enough. He, who was tainted by the doubts of man, screamed out into the night why he had to suffer so. Deep in the ruins of London, after having chased down the former number 12 of Seal, he found a case full of the greater good. The other materials of the setting were there, but lacking figures. He had read the works of man, understood their signs, and held it all in contempt. Yet that one, paper, ink, and plastic, it seemed to reach into his soul. The printing date he saw implied that either was finished in a hurry, or... Angels did not believe in destiny, but they knew that their reality was at best, subjective. I wonder, is it possible? Can I believe I already know Shinji Akari that much? Is my hate enough? He didn't know what to feel when Satya was killed, stuck between man and angel, holding the shattered remains of Adam's soul. He could only hope that the others proved stronger than he. Stronger, perhaps, but not wiser. He sought out Shamsul, who rebuffed him. That other angel saw him as even like the Evangelion, a twisted mockery of truth. Shamsul died. Ramil was confident in its form. When an angel dies, its soul dispersed into the others that remained. Power was not transferred, but some knowledge and instincts. The last moment, the final primal emotions of its life. That was what all others received, no matter where in the world they slept. Kaoru remembered the fear. He screamed awake in his suite in Imperial Hotel Berlin. That soul, not like a lilim, not like an angel. That was when he started to research Shinji Akari. Again, he touched the spines of the pilot's school books. Everything so far pointed to the mundane. There was no reason for that power. It seemed undeserved. Yet the moment he saw the other's picture, he knew. Those eyes, seen through the illusion of time and free will. Kaoru knew he'd seen his equal at last. Adam's ancient memories whispered, Here is the destroyer. Gagil sensed Adam's movement. It acted on its own. Gagil died too. Israfel had sought him out. It asked for his advice. Karu knew what he had to do. Shinji Akari must die. Only one could be the messiah. Karu knew where his loyalties lay and it wasn't with the small mortals. But one could learn from them. They were the masters of the world. Israfel, dead. Sandalfon was desperate. It had reached out to the other angels but they were in hiding. Only one angel may reach Adam, and whoever does would receive its power. It couldn't be shared. This was etched into their very DNA, to ensure that only the strongest would become the new Adam and perpetuate their race into the stars. He was inspecting Nerve China then, when out of the surf that angel appeared to try and nearly kill him, to compress him into an embryonic form as an attack that could pierce through any AT field. Carol defeated the other easily, and taught the beast about strategy. Sandalfon dead. He closed his eyes and listened. The winds outside, the crickets in mid-afternoon, the distant roars of the main road. He opened his being to the possibilities. While he hated young Akari, he also yearned to know him. In another time, they could have been friends. However, such power, if left unchecked, would only doom all. Adam's release and then subsequent loss of power did these Lillen believe all that would just fade into the cold of space? The light of the soul was more than that. Karu opened his eyes again. Sunshine had faded, falling onto the room in strips of smoky shine. He brought his attention to the conceptual advisers of young Ikari. Get out! He heard a female voice command in his mind. You have no place here! Leave! Now! He heard a distant, familiar voice. How far do you see, ancient one? Too far. Look too high to the night sky and stumble upon the pebbles in your path. Karu lightly touched the tip of the Eldar's helmet and heard her scream. Your time is done. Accept it and be gone, he said. 
the scream intensified and faded off into nothingness. And his mind suddenly exploded with the possibilities. He began to hear the others clearly. It did not matter if they were real or not, if they had actual identities or just manifestations of a disturbed mind. Kozo Fusky was a professor in metaphysics, and to him, a soul was a persistent a form of identity. One could either believe it power, or the inevitable understanding of quantum physics upon the universe. Kaoru was an angel, impure and fallen, where once he was all soul, he was trapped into the flawed constraints of flesh. Stops ya! Stops ya good! He heard the green skin roar. Grr! Needs to move! I know you! Foul Zeno, I know you! bellowed the space marine. You dare defile this sanctuary with your presence! By the light of the Emperor, be cleansed in purifying flame! Strangely, the Chaos Marine was silent. The tiny figure seemed to stand implacable, staring up at the much bigger being in front of him. These are the thoughts in Akari's mind. So like a lilim, so limited, so self-contradictory. And at the same time, infinite in its potential. The light of the soul leaves a wake that couldn't be detected with mere instruments. What was his identity? Each cell knows not of the whole it creates. Plastic is composed of the same subatomic particles that could make flesh. Life was more than just matter. That was how angels could live and make decisions, even when in just viral form. Karu dimly remembered Adam's true power. Ritsuko had said they were made of material which had the properties of both rave and particle. Angels were all merely realised potential. They were ghosts and miracles of themselves. He turned to the figurines and reached out to them. The concepts did not reside in mere plastic, but in Shinji's mind. Only a Lilim could be so obtuse as to not know what his own mind was doing. Angels didn't have a conscious or a subconscious. Uh, Shinji Akari, thought Karu. If we could meet... If we did not need to see each other's deaths, I would tell you about a boy that tried to know everything. A boy born with the awareness of a being vast and endless. A boy who saw the injustice in everything he saw. There was no being in this vast world that could call me friend. Until I found these relics. Do we have that much in common? I believe so. I believe we could call each other friend. If only our potentials did not naturally leech from each other. There is no justice, Akari. Your kind usurped our whole. Yet, in the greater good, that might perhaps be to our benefit. It will be ours again, not for revenge or for malice, but because we are the ones worthy of all that power. We are all in each our own way, little gods, and now you as well. But that is not enough. Our mother was a sacrifice for her own destiny. Like you, there is no hope for us but victory. Worthy, crooned the thousand sun. Power that flows only from within. How much more crippled can you be? Kaoru visualised it in his mind. These strange figures standing as monoliths to their ideals. All different expressions of life itself. In countless eras, it always boiled down to each different philosophy. Alone. I was so alone, cut off from the others of my kind, my soul bound to one form. I cannot imagine how you Lilim can bear this, just as you cannot imagine just how immeasurably grand it is to be one of us. Souls forever locked in the material plane. I, even with the eye of Sinch, cannot conceive of a more pitiful existence. The Bright Lord is the key to the universe, and he will free it from the forgotten war that still rages in the heavens. Neither of Adam nor Lilith. We are the masters of our own identity. We are born of his soul, and even as we converse, you know. His presence fills us, said the Space Marine. He is with us, always, even as we are with him. We live not here in these material shells, but in the vast expanse of his mind. This is what you fear, little god. He is the warp. He is change itself. 
That is our way, the yearnings of mortality. We creatures, separate and small, change the universe to suit ourselves. We shall spiral out into infinity and erase your kind from existence. It's gonna be the war and all wars! Leslie finds our way to get us another universe to stomps you around in. He did not wonder about how it was possible. Where the knowledge came from. Adam was ancient beyond ancient, for even as it seeded a world, it sent another made in its image outwards to continue the task. The memories, the souls, so much so that the endless shape in its incarnations no longer seemed self aware, having seen and felt and destroyed so many in its journey. Karu held the confidence common to his kind. He knew deep in his being that theirs was a success. They were winning the war in the heavens. The lingering glow of Shinji's soul glimmered, fading slowly. It would return in the proper time, but now he knew that specific essence. Know the enemy, know thyself, and the battle was all but won. The screen door slid open. Hey, said Kaji. Ah, yelped Karu in a rare loss of composure. He turned, glaring at the spy for his interruption. Why do you disturb me, Inspector Ryuji? Kaji merely smirked in return. Well, I'm done with my inspection, so... No. No secret documents, no hidden spy cameras, no recorders. I did inject the monitoring the virus into Masato's computer. He jerked a thumb back. So, we go? Yes. I, too, am done with my observations. Karu Nagisa turned away from the table. Kaji noticed the things obscured by his back. Toys? He stepped closer to see. <laughs> I remember playing with Gunpla when I was younger. What are these? He blinked. Is that a chainsaw? Karu touched the head of each. Intolerance of the Space Marine. Arrogance of the Eldar. Avarice of the Chaos Marine. Murder of the War Boss. I find it intriguing why so many are so absorbed by such notions. What's a good story without conflict? Kaji replied, shrugging. He remembered Gundam. Perfect people just don't seem real. It's more than just cool explosions, you know. It's also about getting past those, and the hero triumphing after surviving and learning all that he needed. It seems such a needless waste of time. Some of those plot-induced lessons are just so obvious. Hey, people aren't born perfect. Sometimes we need a good slap in the face to wise up. Karu sniffed. Indeed. He saw Kaji looked entirely too serious. You did not bring back a souvenir from Katsuragi San's drawers, did you? What? No, of course not. Though he was really tempted to. In the end, he stuck a camera over her bed. Then, saw you? He winced. Oh, God, no. Ask her. She's a good kid, but really... So she has been a lot less clingy lately. Maybe Shinji's getting to her after all. Kao chose not to enlighten him about how he had more to do with that. He looked at the room one last time and turned to go. What about you? You were alone in this room for a long time. The seal angel squinted aside. Just what are you implying? He asked in a low tone. I would advise you to choose your words carefully as well. Although, he paused and looked up, I suppose Shinji Kari is very compelling in many ways. He blinked. But no. Kaji made a face. Let's just get out of here. Working alongside the boy, he was just getting creepier by the minute. The day passed into afternoon and towards sunset. The tall group took a refreshment break while the pilots prepared their avers. Asuka rated outside in her unit too, sweltering from the heat. The plug was deep inside and cooled appropriately, but she couldn't enter her aver without instinctively reaching for a nominal level of sink. That much she needed to at least look around, to perceive of its senses. She looked around. The place was empty due to the heat radiating off the pavement. Everything seemed misty. She said out loud. When the girl gets a new gun and Baka Shinji gets a whole new set of gear, don't I get anything? 
Was it not you who lengthily insulted pilots Akari, the JSSDF, and most of Japan Japanese culture of a public broadcast channel pilot saw you? <laughs> Masato's voice laid over Ray's radio link. Sorry, Asuka, but it's surprising that they're even so civil so far. Though she did find a bit about Girls' Day funny. How Asuka knew about Ranma Saitomi was a mystery. That's not fair! Completely. The operations director applied further, grinning back at in his slash trident employee cafeteria. She sipped at her orange juice and let the sound of clinking ice cubes carry over the link. Almost everyone else was under a large shady tent, with buckets of cold drinks available for free. Life isn't fair. Deal with it. Over Unit 2 stamped its foot angrily. How long do I have to stay out here? Not sure. Hold on. Hey, Maya! How much longer until they finish putting on the Type-T equipment? The lieutenant spoke to a headset, asking Ritsuko, who was within the hangar. Only a few more minutes, Miss Sato-senpai, she replied. The screen of her laptop flicked back to the simulation data sent by the JSSDF. She grinned in anticipation of loading that into the magi. This is unfair, Asuka said again. Shinji heard that and the understated pain in the other pilot's tone. She felt neglected and unappreciated. Asuka deserved better than that from him. He opened up another outgoing channel. Takeda-san, said Shinji as a small window opened up in the plug interface. Yes, Sakari-san, replied the project director. He was looking up at the Ava and to one of the external cameras on the Titan exo-frame. Any problems with the connections? No, not really. I do feel slightly cold, but that might be from the additional coolant being pumped around the torso. There is something else, like at the edge of his peripheral vision, but always fleeing as soon as he turns. That unidentifiable feeling, he couldn't say. It wasn't the danger sense. That also felt different. It should go away when the batteries engage. It would be too dangerous to test the reactor while in this first trial one, the man replied, really having learned from the jet alone fiasco. Don't try too much too fast, step by step, until you reach the conclusion you desire. That this was Shinji's very own doctrine only meant well for both. It isn't too heavy? No, the Evangelion can handle it. I'm not sure to what degree it'll slow me down in combat, but then this is why we try. He paused for a few moments. But that's not what I wanted to ask. Don't you have something for Asuka? Ah, that. Presenter Takita moved away from the view to talk to a nearby engineer. After some time, he turned back to the screen. Yes, we finished that. The device has its own internal battery, but is also an optional power feed to the Ava. That isn't done yet. But does it work? Is the battery installed? Yes, sure. It's ready to go. Then I'd appreciate it if you showed it to Asuka. Shiro Takita nodded. All right. At the very least, that was one more thing he could explain slash brag about. He moved away and Shinji closed the link. The project director went over to relay instructions. Asuka saw the Trident Land Dreadnought emerge from the hangar, dragging a large box behind it. The stumpy war machine went over towards her and stopped right in front of the Ava. Magnetic clamps disengaged and were rolled back under the Dreadnought's primary armour. All right, saw you, son, said Maya, sitting leaned back on her command chair. Here's a present for you too. You may stop whining now. What's that? The Ava leaned over to poke at the war machine. You want to start something, shoddy? A smaller video window opened up, showing Musashi's face. Don't underestimate us. If we were allowed to, we'd kick your ass. He still hadn't got all over how easily and thoroughly she would beat him at every athletic pursuit. Kate's own comm window. Look, everything here's already too expensive as it is. Please don't exaggerate things further. Let's not have to repair things before we even face a true combat scenario. He sighed. I apologize for my teammate, soyu san Please, see what we have here. Why are you taking sides with that bit? Kata hastily pushed a button. Silence, fortunately. The dreadnought stood silent as its occupants bickered within. After a while, the red Ava made a shrug and moved past towards the large metal crate. It opened the container. Asuka gasped at what she saw within. What is this? Ah, Miss Soyu, this is something made specifically for you. While it is acknowledged that the four eyes of your Ava make for greater accuracy and positional judgment, it's in close combat that you really shine. I'm not maligning the prognites that nerve issues to you, but there are still so many other options available. 
Where are you? She asked of the over-enthusiastic Takita. Look down. Near your left foot. Indeed, there on a small truck, the project director was speaking into the radio. Shouldn't you be helping Shinji with his new stuff? Pah! I'm no engineer. I've already done everything I should have done there. He then pointed up and aside to the crate. Please, pick it up. Asuka reached into the crate. The presenter continued. Even in close combat, range is important. You know of the chainsaw, the very respected close combat weapon for the Evangelions. However, even that isn't perfect. It is awesome, true. But its utility is hampered by the difficulty of making sure you don't slice your own limbs off while using it. It has a guard on only one side, with the ripping blade held outwards. It's a weapon of pure attack. You can only parry with the back of the chainsword, with the relatively thin metal casing. I'd even go so far as to say, you really shouldn't try to parry with a chainsword, blade side or guard. This, however... The Red Evangelion brought out a great Ava-sized axe, painted red in its own colours. Its edge was a series of ripping prog blades. Oscar turned the latch and it roared into furious activity. Evangelion CCW2CA, in his name, the Mighty Chain Axe, shouted the project director. Now this is a weapon with devastating attack while allowing for a measure of defence. The flat sides are thick metal and can be used to block. Look there. Even if the prog bits fail, the cutting edge of the chain axe still has two sharpened edges to bite into the enemy. Asuka took an experimental swing. It was heavier, yes. Slower. Also, that much more additional force of each blow. The cutting blades were always away from the real dern, so such a terrible weapon was actually safer to use. It was convenient, perhaps, as a berserker barely had any attention to spare for anything other than eviscerating the enemy. This is great! Rooped Oscar, slashing wildly. Wow! I like it! I really like it! Winds passed over the truck below, engulfed entirely by the massive shadow of that weapon. Shiro Takita laughed nervously. We are pleased to hear that, Pilot Soyu. We of, in his technologies, live to serve. He then whispered to the driver, Get us out of here now! This is great! Asuka cried out again. I can't wait to try it out against Shinji! How ungrateful can you get? Drifted across the open radio link. The Evangelion turned towards the dreadnought, standing there jutting its hips out contemptuously, or as far as it was able to, which wasn't much. What did you say? Asked Asuka, her voice shrill, holding a chain axe. She felt so tall, so mighty. In fact, it might even be said, hi. You have the guts now that I'm paying attention? Then let me say it again, Mana replied in deliberate tones. She pulled on a new gold-trimmed great cap and grinned out a bit. Her co-pilots were shaking their heads and raving their arms about, trying to get her to stop. You're an ungrateful little princess. Shinji Ikari asked of that specifically for you. He even designed the form. And what do you want to do as soon as you get it? You want to use it against him. How much more self-serving can you get? It's like you can't be strong without pulling down everyone around you. You're weak, Asuka. You don't deserve him. You bitch! How dare you! Asuka knew how much she'd suffered for the sake of the Ava. For these of the JSSDF getting too ahead of themselves, it was unforgivable. What do you know? You and all your useless arrogance too! I'm the one fighting against the angels! I'm the one who endures all that pain to win! How dare you! I'll carve you up! How dare you! You don't know. You're no great prize either. An ominous hum rose from the dreadnought. Do not preach to Magnus Tancred about pain, Mana Kirishima said in a flat, remorseless tone. Do you think we don't know about pain? You're not the only one who can fight for humanity, sir, you. Don't think you're all that. Without Akari Shinji, we would have nothing. How dare you insult him and his goodwill. The chain axe roared. The Evangelion's eyes flashed angrily. A thick plume of flame erupted from within the dreadnought's clawed left arm and its six-barrel megabolter whined to a ready state. Hey! Hey! Misato shouted into the comm channel. We're supposed to be allies here! We're supposed to be friends! Friends? 
retorted Asuka. I'll never be friends with this Ash Creaker! However, she was grinning. She just thrived in an atmosphere of competition. Things were getting too boring and predictable back at Tokyo 3. Spanish was a lovely language, whose beauty, some may say, even be magnified when you don't know what it is you're really hearing. As an army brat, Manik Hiroshima knew it well, but for a different reason in the convenience of that tongue. Pisa mi culo, puta! She shot back. Rip and tear! Asuka shouted. Rip and tear! Give me full power! Mana shouted, standing up and pointing out. Glory to the first man to die! <sighs> Masato began to rub at her head. Now I understand what just Ritsuko goes through. She looked around at all the amused faces of everyone else and gripped at the hand radio until the plastic began to crack. Don't they realise how serious it was? It wasn't more than just girls circling each other for a break. Slap down. There were deadly war machines over there. Such a break in discipline cannot be tolerated. Miss Sato turned to the generals, giving them a shouldn't you be doing something about this? Look. They responded with a, we're old men. What do you expect us to do about jealous teenage girls? No, we're not that crazy or senile. Thank you. Look. Masato was a woman. They trusted her judgment in such matters. Both of you stand down! Shut up! This is a direct order and there will be consequences! Indeed, later, as soon as she thought of something suitably slow and humiliating. The girls obeyed the first. The second, not so much. They continued hurling expletives at each other. Ritsuko arrived after some time. She first checked on Maya's tech readouts and only then noticed Misato's face twitching. What's wrong with you now? The purple-haired woman pointed out towards the strange sight of the Ava and a Dreadnought pacing and squaring off against each other as if liable to plunge into a breakdance duel at any given moment. It was made doubly amusing by the sheer size disparity between the two, stumpy and dwarvish against tall and spindly. She held up the radio phone. Ritsuko's lips twitched at hearing what was being batted about. She could understand both languages. Do they even know what each other's saying? Misato asked. At this point, I'd say not, but does it matter? Misato groaned. Why do we need these children again? Why should we even take this headache? All right, or the world will end. Ugh, life sucks. She slumped forwards, putting her face to the table. She turned her head to the side to stare up at her old friend. So, what about Shinji-kun? We've finished. Give me the radio. She took it out of Misato's hand and spoke in a gentle, soothing tone. Shinji's ready for you now. Please be careful for the second phase of the Evangelion proprietary weapons test. The two large mecha paused and turned towards the mammoth sliding doors of a hangar. Everyone in the mobile cafeteria also went out for a better look. The door slid open with grinding slowness. A vague shape was all that could, they could see. One step. Woof! Something gargantuan, seemingly hunched over, slowly emerged. Another step. Woof! The ground shook with every footfall. Such was its scale and its promise of pitiless power. It was no longer an Evangelion. It was not a Titan. It was something both and neither, and powerful beyond reason. Titanicus! Principio Eternus! It roared. The sound filled the air, sending even the aluminium walls to shaking. While everyone knew the Titan modules were merely worn over the Ava's normal armour, it seemed as if the beast was now complete, like it could never be anything else than that magnificent, almost godly might. Its armour was thick and forbidding, its guns the biggest and baddest there was. The winged skull shone under the sun. It retained the colours of the Ava in purple and green, but in muted, deathly shades. The Titan, Godslayer walked past. Everyone on the ground shielded their faces, and the top of the cafeteria tent snapped briskly. So massive was its armoured form that it created air currents with its every step. Holy shit, muttered Masato, looking up with nearly religious awe in her eyes. We're gonna win! The technicians, the designers, the administrators, everyone who had ever worked on the thing were far less resistant. It took all their strength not to bow, from that overpowering feeling of both fear and awe plunging deep into their souls. Maya clapped her hands together to make a small prayer. 
I don't know. It is impressive, said Ritzko. I think the colours are a bit garish, though. Misano looked at her as if she was crazy. The scientist gave back a twisted smile. Of Evangelians, artificial humans wearing armour that had artificial muscles that should improve even their own brute strength, mobile fusion reactors and... Is he trying to lighten the load by pushing up with his AT field? Is that anti-gravity? Or just lift? Eh. She chuckled. I suppose I'm just getting used to this. How many of those little blue pills did she have again? Six? Eight? Twelve? Ritzko made a mental note. As a doctor, she could write her own prescription. However, best to let Maya regulate that. One harmful addiction was enough. On the other hand, one Akari-induced headache was already too much. The generals were less generous in their impressions. General Monaro winced at the very sight. He was getting too old for that sort of thing to affect him. You do realise you just gave Shinji Akari the means to flatten all of Japan if he wants, right? Fifteen hours, General Asagiri shuddered. It was bad enough when he simulated our total defeat in just under one hour. We'd have to use nukes now. All our nukes. And would there even be a Japan after it's all done? I trust your boy. Trust in the boy isn't misplaced, continued the stooping Minara, whose hands were shaking as he held his cane. It was too late to turn back. They'd all locked themselves into one course of action. He was going blind, but blind faith was something he didn't accept so easily. Believe. Not in me who believes in him. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. Does it really feel like we're putting our hopes into a hollow container? I trust young Akari. In helping him, we're as much fighting for everyone else. Now we just have to ensure the elder Akari doesn't manipulate this for his own benefit. It's the angels that are the enemy, and harming Shinji Akari should be treason against the whole human race. Later, we can think strategy. He smirked a bit. But what can just one boy do? What does he want? Principio Eternis roared once more. It knew nothing mightier than itself. Win. We have to win. The power of man is man in himself. General Kiyosato Akira finished softly. We have the tools. We have the will. Now all that's left is to see it through to the end. The day Shinji Akari was dreading came to pass. Valentine's Day. In Japan, tradition was for the girls to give the boys chocolates as a sign of affection. It was a day both anticipated and feared by teenagers. Many had apprehensions about not having the courage to make their feelings known or simply not receiving any. Social pressure was intense and even more so post-impact and in Tokyo 3 First Municipal Junior High. There weren't that many students after all and everyone knew almost everyone else. Humiliation was the most common source of teenage angst. Shinji feared it for different reasons. Back in his old junior high in Sendai, he was the only freshman to get chocolates from seniors. Though thin and short in stature, he was never considered geeky. The day he went into the school, he became alpha male instantly. The Yankees and other troublemakers tried, but most were brought down with just a long stare. There were very, very few students that enter high school at the head of their own private army. His thoughtful, methodical ideals ensured good grades. His guardians weren't wealthy, but he had the treasure in connections, from the chief of police to town mayor to the actual wealthiest people in town. One could look into the confidence in his eyes and not think that this was a boy who would be very important some day. The notion was that even if he was still scrawny, eventually he'd grow up to be the perfect boyfriend. Kind, attentive and still capable of kicking ass. Even back then he had a helping people thing, and the boys trusted him with their problems. With foresight, with courage, with manipulations, with exuberance, every life he touched was made brighter somehow. The boys believed in him utterly. As long as it's the boss, then everything's going to be okay. They believed he knew everything that needed to be known, and so far hadn't failed them yet. Shinji was so well-read and so used to odd trains of thought that he didn't notice when he was saying things he couldn't possibly have had any idea. The young teens, of course, had elder sisters and parents who could see the signs of that good influence. As such, his opinion slowly began to suffuse through the town until it almost had the force of law. Not many realised it, of course. What they did only seemed like a natural change of pace.
He had to eat all those chocolates, as to not insult their respect. They put their hearts into it, and it was the least he could do to show his thanks. He had to be taken to the hospital. There were at least three times as many girls in Tokyo 3 first junior high. He still hadn't figured out what to do as to not seem insulting. He appreciated them, as even fangirls were people with real emotions and real fears. For the most, that was the farthest they could go, too afraid to dare any more. All they wanted was some pathetic sliver of his recognition, and he could have denied him that. Not all suffering was so obvious. Still, what was worse was afterwards, when the ambulance had to take him out of the school, the fangirls he'd gathered at age were so guilty they flooded his room with flowers. When they were forbidden that, the front of the hospital started to look like a shrine with all those offerings. He's not dead yet, one of the doctors shouted. Stop making it look like a funeral! Which of course only made them even more stricken, as if they were bringing off a bad omen. Eventually he had to mobilise the boys to restore order and reason. Or the right and proper. Ominous feelings were boiling inside the school cafeteria. The air felt heavy. Now and then a certain chill passed over him, as segments of the student population would slowly glance over to the centre table, turning away, only to have another section turn their heads en masse to that direction. Now and then a nervous giggle wafted through. The focus of that attention was not, strangely enough, Shinji Akari. It was directed at Mana Kirishima, seated there with the inner circle. In less than a month, she had risen so quickly in the social ranks. Pilot a giant robot capable of destroying armies within minutes to save the world was the highest possible standing, literally towering above even magnets or politicians. What was it about Mana Kirishima? Her two friends sat slumped over, several tables away, alternating between looking fondly at her and glaring at Shinji. So obviously... By her own merits was she admitted to work their clique. Even Soryu, who looked annoyed, didn't seem to contest it. Now merit could be such a suggestive word. Kensuke was very enthusiastic, but two boys of actual military training would just go berserk at any implication against their beloved manor. Hikari knew all this. She had to keep the disgruntled masses contained, especially before Valentine's Day, or the school would just collapse. Fortunately, the colourful cults of Ayanami, Soryu and Ibuki were ready to offer their... assistance. Kirishima had to be worthy too, and anything else was an indirect insult to their own idols. Not that she wouldn't jump him given half the chance, but there were also defenders waiting there. The Kirishima fan club was still germinating, though the colour green was decided upon. A nice, restful colour, reflecting her girl-next-door charms. She was such a normal and likeable girl, if prone to spacing out, and as such through her many could vicariously fulfil their fantasies. However, that same model appeal could also fuel deeper envy. If she could have it, why couldn't they? What made her so special, really? Day by day, Tokyo 3 was getting more and more insane. Shinji smiled a bit. Still, it was a good kind of insane, of people cutting loose and doing things from the heart. They were a vibrant generation, even as it might all suddenly end. There was something about the spectre of death that forced people to enjoy the passing moments of their lives. He frowned slightly. Ugh. Like many of the ways of chaos, it brought what should be a good thing to horrific extremes. That was why, given the choice, he made the decision to side with the Emperor. Good one, because it was brilliant. Chaos reached its apex by stealing all that carefully prepared strength. Shinji despised cheaters. Given a choice, he made a mental note. If you need me to be a god, then so be it. Considering the 10,000 years of the Imperium afterwards, a little worship would be a small price to pay, considering that they had to end up worshipping him anyway to keep the Imperium together. But that, as he mused, was besides the point. Surviving tomorrow would be his main chore. He had his own ideals, and he wouldn't violate them. Good was an object that was always in motion, seeking a balance lest it twist into something more vicious than mere shameless evil. His thoughts lately were drifting to such questions of what he'd take or give up in the name of power. Taking advantage of his fangirls, for example, would not be just an evil act, but a pointless act. A wondrous future in exchange for temporary gratification? <laughs> The real historic harem, he had read up about it, and these were more about political and socio-economic power than sex. Now just have no one ask him about wanting a harem and he wouldn't have to lie. These girls, he gazed at them fondly, were the ones he could truly trust. What are you looking at, Bakugo?
Parker? Asker said, turning her face aside. Just you, he said honestly. You seem more energetic recently. You have this happy glow, Asker. I'm glad to see that. Their happiness was his own, of course. Well, don't think sweet-talking me will help you tomorrow. You're on your own, buster! She turned to Ray. Obligatory, damn it! Obligatory! Why do I have to do your stupid customs anyway? We still haven't delivered the chain axe, Manna said in a sing-song imitation. Fine! No more insulting the culture of the people who built the cutting-edge toys for her, Ava. Negative reactions as to the people she'd only just met was more that long diatribe against all of Japan and just mouthing off against Shinji. She looked at him intently, still lost at trying to figure out how he could evoke such loyalty, though. He had no problem with obeying her orders, and freely admitted she was better at piloting. That look, pondering, was easily mistaken for fondness. Oh, to have such troubles, said Toji theoretically. Seeing all that in anime always pissed him off, often of a wussy hero that didn't even deserve all that attention. Damn you, Hikari! Hikari took a shrimp from his brento and began eating it with slow, deliberate chewing. She looked up and raised her left eyebrow. Hmm? She said. Do you really envy that situation that much, Toji? Her mouth twisted down a fraction. Are you bored with me? She added, her tone so soft and uncertain. Is there someone else? No, the teen quickly replied. I'm not. I don't mean anything by it, really. Hikari smiled, beaming. Good, because if it turns out you were doing something like that and not being honest with me, I will make you suffer. All he had to do was be honest. She was always ready to listen. You're all I need, Hikari. His tone was heartfelt. Courage to say what he wanted to say. Courage to master his desires. That was the strength he discovered around Shinji Hikari. Oh, you say the nicest things. The girl blushed and looked away, giggling. Now there's a healthy relationship, Kensuke remarked. Nodding. Ordinarily, he'd be one of those afraid of being unwanted by women, but he had realised that not only did he not care, it turns out that he was liked. To the fangirl, someone in the Shinji posse was acceptable second prize. It didn't harm that he exuded an intensity, a drive to perfection that he'd never shown before. But still, things could get really ugly. The glue holding the different coloured groups together might melt. It could be one big battle royale. He'd be the guy with the camera. You don't shoot the guy with the camera. Hikari calmly and with ladylike poise finished off her lunch. She wiped her mouth with a napkin. She carefully put away her things on the table. Then she stood up, stomped her feet on the table and swung the by now familiar inquisitorial jacket back onto her shoulders. Now listen, she shouted in a tone that brooked no dissent. By special order of the Tokyo Free City Council, now of operations in the Cultural Ministry of Japan, Shinji Akari shall not be held a participant in the cultural event commonly known as Valentine's Day. Who here wanted to give chocolates? Most of the girls raised their hands, a few boys even. This means no. None of you must give him Valentine's Day boxes. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but it's not necessary to say who. An uproar erupted in the mess hall. Why not? That's unfair! They can't do that! It's taking away our basic civil rights! Inquisitor Haraki revered the storm of their complaints. Think about it. Boxes would be given by girls that he doesn't know all that well. There's a reason the pilots don't accept personal gifts. Not just refusing to be bribed or to feel indebted. Any of those Valentine's Day boxes could be a bomb or poisoned. Too many things can go wrong. This isn't a popularity contest, people. Mana Kirishima stood up, but only onto the bench. Shinji Akari's safety is a vital concern, even if it doesn't seem fair. Would we really want to risk it? It could be seen as a form of harassment, too, if we force it through. The grumblings continued, but they got the point. Send cards if you have to, added Hikari, helpfully. Both girls sat down. The others in their table applauded. Thank you. No big deal, Shinji, replied Hikari. Sometimes you just don't think that the things we take for granted can be frightening things too. She patted his hand, oddly motherly after just being a wall of real power. 
It must be hard to have such expectations thrust upon you. He winced. Not half as bad as what he expected of himself. He knew just how easily fame could be turned into infamy. So he mustn't make a misstep at any point. And so it was Valentine's Day. Kensuke whooped with joy as he walked out to school with an armload of brightly coloured boxes. The auto club, computer club, everything that had to do with machines had him as their unofficial mascot of sorts. There were more than a few girls in those clubs. His father, who had such fears of his son ending the family name, either from dying in combat or just refusing to reproduce, would be very relieved. Here you go, guys, Mana said to her friends. Genki is all out. I just love you guys. Here's your comp obligatory chocolate. Musashi seemed to have crashed his personality OS at the I word. He stood there, numb and gripping the box tightly. Kata just sighed. Did you have to stress the word obligatory, though? But the girl was already skipping off towards Shinji's group. I, I love you too! Masashi shouted suddenly, his brain rebooting. Unfortunately, Mana was already away, so this had the effect of shouting this at Kata's face. Murmurs and squeals began to rise from around them. The boy, at realising what he'd done, promptly crashed his consciousness again, his jaw slack as if screaming out in horror. Kata palmed his face. Idiot! Mana brought out her box of chocolates and bowed deeply. Please accept this, she asked, nearly begging. Thank you, Kirishima-san, he replied gently, taking it. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Mana looked up and saw that Asuka had a white, red-ridden box in her hand too. Is that yours, or did somebody give that to you? Hey, I already gave Shinji my obligatory box first in the morning. He just gobbled it right up. So greedy, she huffed. At the same time, also gratified. She'd done the traditional thing and made it herself. Then who's that for? I understand, with your continued denials of any affection for Pilot to carry. Ray said to the red-haired girl. I will accept, but you're supposed to give such things to a male. Ah! This isn't for you either! Asuka held the box away. At that, Mana looked intrigued, as that was a part of the pilot group dynamic she hadn't seen before. Hey, it's not as if Shinji's the only boy I know. Do I need your permission, oh Shinji Summer? If it makes you happy, don't let me stop you, Asuka. Again, that serene smile. The girl twitched, holding back her irritation. Trying to make him jealous could only backfire horribly. For all his intelligence and personal magnetism though, Shinji was still just a young teenager, with all the internal confusion that implied. The only thing he feared was his own heart. In the strangeness of emerging maturity, it was just easier for him to set that aside and focus on the developing mind. Ignore, ignore, urges and feelings. Could it be better to live as a creature of pure logic? Asuka had Gendo's peculiar favour within Nerve. Unlike Rei, as a distinct personality, she could never be replaced. Shinji opened his heart to the girl and now feared both for her and for Asuka. He delighted in seeing her so free, and knowing he couldn't touch that without putting them both under someone else's control. Mana then turned to Rei, who had her hands empty. Oh, you know me, san I'm surprised. Did you all already give your chocolate to Shinji? with a respectful nod to him, as it was considered impolite to refer to someone as if he wasn't there. The military, oddly, was full of old-fashioned formality like that, despite the radical newness of their approach. Alicia was relaxed enough to cease putting the San after his name, though perhaps now herself before bullets. Meanwhile, deep in nerve, Ritsuko contemplated a box of chocolates. Insanity, said she. She opened the box and took a bite. Tradition dictates that a worthy offering on Valentine's Day be handmade. Cooking is a skill that I lack, said Ray, so I have decided to offer something else instead. It is also said, in gift giving, that it is the thought that counts. Eh? Hey, I call bullshit on that! What's the point of tradition if you're just going to change it whenever you feel like it? Asuka retorted. After all the hassle she'd went through by being called a foreigner, the Nadasiko one just decides to up and abandon the task? Still, because Ray couldn't cook, she wasn't so perfect after all. She just looked the part. Little things like that made being around the other pilot bearable. Little things like that also made her all the more irritating. It was almost sisterly banter, innuendos aside, and they both liked that. It was harmless contradiction, playing upon their own separate characters. They'd accepted it would be impossible to change the other. 
Friends. It wasn't if Ray was trying to seduce her. Was she? Her and Manor. Now that was more acerbic. Their rivalry was born of a series of misunderstandings and a similar stubbornness in the idea that they were the one in the right. It wasn't the softening effect of being teammates. Manor was unwilling to defer to Asuka in the same way Shinji and Ray would obey their team leader. Simply, the soldier girl wouldn't recognise a civilian special authority over her outside of combat. Asuka thought the other pretentious. Manor thought the other arrogant. Too often it was tone that sparked fierce debate rather than a conflict of factual analysis. And while they bickered, another walked away with the prize? No, no way, mumbled Manor. She clutched her hair and looked down at the ground as if stupefied. It's not one of those things. The image as seen in manga rose to the forefront of her mind. Something like... Ikarikun, the truth is, I don't really have a chocolate present for you. Ray would say, and perhaps there's something else, he would say. Yes, and that is. She would pull down on her blouse to expose her shoulder and hint at her lacy bra. Me. Mana pulled at her hair and raised her face to the heavens to let out a soundless scream. She considered something like that, but had for some reason passed out in the middle of speculating over the daring thought. Unfortunately, Shinji knew exactly what she was thinking about. He looked to Ray, who alas had grown quite adept at hiding her thoughts when embarking upon some basic naughtiness. No help or hope there. Ah, <sighs> Toji greeted, approaching them. You people look like you're having fun. Did you get into trouble today, Shinji Kun? asked Akari. No, no trouble. Everyone's behaving. He noticed how Akari and Toji had apparently switched jackets. Though free to accept others chocolate, his other admirers were too afraid to approach an obviously calm Toji. For no readily discernible reason, really. To have them expelled or tormented just from that would be of disapproving pettiness upon Hikari's part. She had authority simply because she wouldn't abuse it. The jock was carrying a green plastic bag. A large white box bound with a red ribbon was in, and was presumably Hikari's gift. Toji reached into the bag and took out a small fist-sized box. Eh, this one's yours. Silence and deep stares met that statement. It's from my sister, okay? He added, shouting to anyone that might be wondering. You know, she's still serious about her marrying you someday. Shinji winced. Toji's tone was actually consenting, if not insistent. Hikari rummaged around the bag to take out a similar package. This is from Nozomi. You'll have of whatever she says nowadays. The little girl's crush was tempered at least by her knowledge that she had to be strong enough to stand with him. The boss don't need no wimp weepy useless bints. Shinji took them. Three Valentine's Day chocolates, two from little girls and one from someone he already liked. They were the obvious exemptions. It was a good plan. The group began to walk to the front gate, having banal conversation, a good ending to a good day. A truck beeped loudly. It stopped in front of the school, right in front of the gates. It had a stylized H made into a sparkling treasure stash. A large, suspicious-looking man in blue work overalls got out of the back. Hikari and Manor immediately put themselves in front of Shinji. The former spoke sharply as the delivery man approached. What do you want? We got a delivery for Shinji Akari. Chocolates from his hometown. A letter, too. Authorization papers! Hikari challenged further. Don't think you're not being observed right now. No security should be around. She looked behind him and saw several black suited men step out from behind the trees across the street. The Hoka worker brought out several stapled sheets of paper. He handed them over and briefly glanced at Shinji at his dark, questioning stare. He purposely kept his eyes to the ground after that, as Hikari looked over the permits. Nerve security clearance, military pass, and a health board inspection. The girl licked her lips and for a moment considered her duty. More than just making sure the pilots were free from hassle, she was actually the one responsible for their well-being outside of nerve facilities. A misjudgment on her part could also be the trigger for a disaster of nigh-apocalyptic proportions. Hikari? asked Toji. It should be safe, she replied. Why do you need a truck? Is it some world record slab or something? Well, according to the young miss, what a Gary san would like would it be a valentine all on his own. They were from his town and had driven from there overnight. 
They remembered well his pitiful overdose. We brought chocolates for everyone in the school. Shinji chuckled. That's thought for her. Please tell minasei chan I really appreciate this. minasei chan Now Asuka was curious. she never heard him refer to anyone in such familiar intimacy before. Who's that? She's a girl I know from my hometown, he replied in disarming honesty. A girlfriend? Not really, no. But you could say we were close friends. Mana's mind reeled from all the possibilities in spinning black and white. She felt like fainting. Someone. An old childhood friend. That was the most common of all the plot points. The most stable of relationships. Often when the pairing's not the one that's chosen, the parting is the most tragic and bittersweet. She pinched her nose. Shinji was thankfully looking away from her. Two more workers got out, gently bringing a large gift wrap box. A third man emerged with a white cardboard box, marked with the Hoko logo, who went over her head and laid that down. The teens tensed as he brought out a utility knife, but he just cut the seals on the box. He took out several smaller boxes moulded in plastic faux ebony, ribboned with strips of gold foil. Please accept these with our compliments, he said, bowing and holding one out to Asuka. The girl hesitantly took it. She opened it up, running her thumb to break the airtight seal. Inside were little cubes of dark chocolate. She took one and popped it into her mouth. <coughs> she gurgled out. Is something wrong? Mana asked, having gotten a box too. What the hell? This is Belgian dark chocolate! Asuka had another piece. Mmm. After savouring that, she frowned at both Shinji and the delivery man. This is great quality chocolate! Storeboard. Screw tradition. But... For everyone in the school? Nods all around. Mary, they asked Hikari. Are those custodians? The girl shouted into the schoolyard. To me! Several boys went running over, instantly breaking off from whatever they were doing. They lined up in front of her. Get everybody to dine up. This is Valentine's Day and everybody's getting chocolates from Hikari. Really? Go! Yes, ma'am. And off they went. How many boxes do you have in that truck anyway? She asked the delivery man. There might not be enough. Let's see. The transport team leader considered it. About 20 packs to one big box. We've got about 100 of those. The school population was less than 600 students. More than enough. Put it this way. We have more than a ton of these things inside that truck. Toji whistled through dark stained teeth. Nice. Mean to say, person, this is too extravagant. I'm suspicious. Oscar had to comment. Mana had to agree. Let us use logic, Ray began. Clearly, Shinji kun has the attention of someone with some wealth. They knew each other from childhood. Were you classmates? Since fourth grade elementary. Mana flinched visibly at that. Ray turned to the delivery men. If she has obvious regard for Shinji kun, these boxes, expensive as they are, would be insufficient. Is that larger package for him? At the positive response, she faced him next. I must admit to being curious as well. May we see it? The whole Coles held a land opportunities company, dealing in properties and construction. Their venture in the properties in Tokyo 3 had paid off handsomely, as the Ava's continuing victories was giving people confidence to attempt settling back into the city. The creation of industries for technical and manufacturing support also helped. However, they retained only nominal holdings within the city proper after their great gamble. After having bought and sold at great profit, they invested towards less destructible assets. That was at Shinji's suggestion as well. A truck full of chocolates, hell, an entire fleet of them, was but a pittance compared to what he'd brought to them. He didn't even need to remain in someone's presence to promote an insane level of loyalty. Shinji began unwrapping the gift and peered inside. He began laughing. What is it? Asuka and the others crowded to see. They were confused, save Ray, who hid her mouth behind her hands and just grinned underneath. It was a slab of red chocolate, in the shape of a strange winking skull with a large jagged toothed maw. The sign of the boys recognised Ray, Toji and Hikari. If the latter needed any more evidence of who the boss was, she had it now. Shinji noticed a small white envelope taped to the inside of the box. He took it out and opened it up. Inside was a calligraphed sheet of paper and a picture. 
That strange, contented smile was one they'd never seen before, and the sadness in his eyes faded before the blissful memories of a more innocent time. Oscar peered over his shoulder to read. Those days we had, for them we live, our love for you. Please don't forget us, Hoko Minase, Mitsugane Ayane. The picture showed the two girls smiling at the camera. Minase was tall and poised as usual, while Ayane had a distinctly conniving grin. Both had grown into beautiful young women. He'd been gone for only half a year, but it felt like forever. Even if he knew that the gulf of his experiences and his plans had separated him cleanly from the shy young boy that they had seen. Still, they knew him well. They're pretty, Oscar said flatly. She plucked the picture out of his hand and let everyone else see it. You've been holding out on us, man, Toji said with a smirk. Who'd have thought you'd leave behind such beauties? So cruel of you. He turned to Hikari. Hey, I can look, can I? Mana was shaking, fitting together things in her mind. According to plot, the highest chances for getting together was whomever the protagonist met first. The girls they knew best and vice versa. She knew her role by those terms. She was the girl that just comes out of nowhere to latch onto him. At best, serving to add jealousy. Unless the competition gets bumped off. She shook her head. No, such selfishness was unworthy of him. Shinji gained another level in awesome to his peers in age. Sure, he was impressive enough in an Ava, but saving the world collapsed into, And what have you done for us recently? It was just too big, too impersonal, and they could fear him as much as revere him for that. However, such simple generosity proved that he did care for the happiness of the people around him. Such a guilty luxury, they could never have found that taste on their own. You know what? One of the students remarked, We don't need a student council president. We need a student council emperor. Shinji Okami Ikari no Tenno has a nice ring to it, don't you think? I take severe issue to being ousted over a mere box of chocolates, the currently elected leader said. But it was true that whatever he could do, Shinji would likely get it done faster and more thoroughly. He had too much of a political advantage. Look, this job is as much a hassle as it is a post of respect. Sorry, guys, but I don't think he should be wasting his time like that. The chocolates were distributed, teachers and students alike, and were reserved for those who had already left for home. There were still plenty of leftover boxes. Shinji decided to split that grace between Nerve and the nearby newly constructed military base to house the Trident Land Dreadnoughts and secondary JSSDF operations. They saved a few extra, of course, for Masado. The truck was away, and with all the day's weirdness apparently done, the students then wanted to head home. Rei asked for them to rate, specifically Shinji. Out of their own curiosity, the others also decided to stick around. Soon enough, a metallic shriek in the distance. At the school gates, they saw a large black motorcycle hug the street's T-shaped bend and curving sharply towards them. It went at them in reckless full speed. Rei remained calm, and because of that, her friend stayed. <coughs> The motorcycle spun round to a halt, pushing a thin cloud of dust and the scent of burning rubber towards those waiting there. After most everyone had put their arms down out of fright or trying to shield their eyes, they saw the rider get off. She stood over the matte black motorcycle of uncertain make, clad in ta- tight black leathers, slowly removing her helmet. Under that, she wore dark sports sunglasses that lent a mysterious air to her features. She ran a hand through her short, neck-cropped brown hair and then approached Shinji, swaying her hips with her, her every step. Every male teen there seemed hypnotised by that, tilting their head from side to side. Shinji matched her thin smile. She stopped before him and took off her sunglasses. Hello, Shinji, said Maya, her eyes sparkling with amusement. Hello, Ray. Good afternoon, Sister Ibuki, she replied, nodding a bit. Maya! Asuka shouted, pointing out with a shaky finger. It can't be! You're Maya! I'm hurt, Asuka-chan. After all the time we spent at the labs, I thought you'd be able to recognise me by now. Well, not like that I'm not! Was her retort, while waving down at the woman's garb. What's up with that get-up? Since when were you a biker? So, this is Moira Ibuki, Mana thought, her eyes narrowing. She's very... formidable. 
Maya's tight black, black pants seemed almost painted on. Her midriff was exposed to the world from a blank ta- tank top. She had on a baby leather jacket in aviator brown, covering her arms, shoulders and reaching down to only just above her waist to accentuate all her curves. Maya Buki stood with the live, alluring confidence of a realised woman. The cult of the colour brown, the weakest of the three due to her absence from the scene, just got a large dose of renewed life. Blue, red and green were such cute girls. Ibuki was drool-worthy. So daring, too, to come before Shinji Sama like that. How inspirational. How insane, Asuka thought. Perhaps Maya's attentions were not so sisterly after all. What are you doing here? Asuka asked. Have you come to bestow obligatory chocolates to Shinji-kun? Asked Rei, opening her arms to show she had not. Maya laughed. No, I already gave a box each to Misato and Ritsuko-senpai to mess with their minds. She was already infected with Rei's brand of psychological torture as a device for humour. She looked down at Shinji and leered. Four boxes! You know, I expected more from you. One is a big box, to be fair, added Rei. Would you like some? I don't have much of a sweet tooth, Maya admitted. She was nine when Second Impact happened, and like many, her family became unwilling refugees. Mental trauma from watching a dentist operating with crude instruments and no anesthesia from inside an evacuation centre was to blame for her aversion. That and her parents' use of ginger root as a replacement for tea and coffee. Her sweet bud seemed scarred for life. Were you expecting some from me, shinji Oh, more ammo for the personality cults. He shook his head. He already had their absolute trust. They were already as one without the need for physical joining. Even without contact, their souls sang to each other. Mana put her palms over her eyes and began to sway from side to side in denial. It couldn't be what she was thinking. No. I've got something better. She pointed behind her to a thermal box latched onto the back of her bike. I've got round ham, pastries, ice cream, and since Ray-chan here dislikes meat, several types of salads and tofu substitutes. If you don't have anything too important to do, Shinji-kun, let's go ride around a while. I'm invited as well. Of course. What would this be without you? Maya grinned at the girl. A sunset picnic. How maturely romantic. Ibuki was truly beyond the clumsy yearnings of mere girls. The press club began to cluster around and mutter to themselves about the Ayanami and Ibuki alliance, taking advantage of the Soyu and Kirishima border situation. Maya put her arm around Shinji's shoulders, chummy. So, should we go? Behind that smile, her eyes for a second turned hard and deadly. They needed to talk, and in such a day when all expected such vapid silliness was one in which they were free to just converse with each other. They had to further an impression. Ask her. Could you please just head home and tell Mas- Misato Sano it might be a while? I'll be back in time to cook dinner. Sure, sure, Asuka replied, making a careless gesture she copied from Misato. Though it irked her to have others continually breaking out of the mental box she put them in, it'd be better for her. She could go and search out Kaoru-kun without having to give excuses of her own. As Maya slid back into her bike and Shinji sat sitting too, put his arms around her waist, Mana made a vow to increase her own service to him. She was a pilot now, too. Even if it wasn't a neighbour, she could stand with him. But Maya, a commanding officer, was someone she couldn't bump off the rankings so easily. Ray sat and put her arms around his waist. Ugh, envy! Bad thoughts! Bad thoughts! The motorcycle roared off. Everyone else went on their way. They sped out to the city outskirts, monitoring devices and street cameras watched their trip. The motorbike went up to the bluffs overlooking Lake Ashino. There, under the pale golden glow of the setting sun, Maya spread out a thick blanket for a sunset picnic. The sky was as red as blood, and oddly appropriate for an end to the Day of Hearts. They sat there and waited, basking in the peace they brought to the world. The wind was slight, and added the reminder that soon it would be too dark to see. As such, the lingering light was all the more precious. A black car parked just right up the road. Aiden, Kentaro and Jiro went out and joined them, taking off their shoes before stepping onto the cloth. Were you followed? Shinji asked them. You had other watchers while in the city, but we told them to take a breather. We'd handle tailing you out here, replied Agent Jiro. Got any ham sandwiches? Maya handed one over. Well, are we secure here? This is a random spot. 
I don't think there's any prepared monitoring devices here. A directional microphone might be used. Where he can see all around. Nobody else is here, replied the older agent. He was already helping himself to a small flask of hot coffee. We can't be sure, though. We, not you. Ray, your hand, please. The girl clasped his and passively sent out the IT field. There is no one with an intent to observe this way. I must admit that recently my senses no longer carry so far. I think that's because we're trying to discern intent instead of just feeling for their locations, he replied. He didn't want to explore direct mental contact. The slope to mental domination was just too slippery and too easy. Agent Giro perked up. That's interesting. So you can read minds? As they shook their head, just emotions, he asked then, So what, is there some sort of soul reader? In principle, yes, said Ray. Both agents looked to Maya, who held up her hands as if warding them off. Hey, don't look at me. I don't have any idea how it works either. I didn't even tell Ritzko's senpai of the possibility. She's got enough to analyse already. All that matters is that it works. Shinji grinned a bit. We're here. Let's eat. And so they sat in repast and spoke of things trivial and non-trivial. They spoke of the things they had done and experienced, for it was weeks since the conspirators had last been able to speak so freely with each other. The food was not expensive or presented with much flair, but very filling nonetheless. Perhaps it had something to do with the location and the company. It's very really peaceful, isn't it? said Agent Jiro. The sun was already half below the horizon. The last thing to attack didn't do any damage. The economy is good, the people are happy. It's really peaceful. Too peaceful, added the other. I wonder how long this will last. It will last until we no longer have the life to defend it, said Shinji, firmly. Angels and the conspiracies of the dying. These people didn't need all that. They had meaning enough in the days of their lives. After some time, when they were nearly done, Agent Kentaro said unto him, So you're saying Nagase, you know? I know. Aren't you going to do something about it? Even if you don't like her, she's still your comrade, and he's still Seal. But I do like her, he replied, and even such a bold statement hardly fazed the two women with him. It makes her happy, but even as I know it can end well, cutting it short would put her at risk. If she's of no further use to him, then I can't ensure her safety. He sighed. Did you not say to me that a living spy was far more useful than a dead one? She won't believe me without proof, and I can't offer that proof without revealing what I'm up to. I have not seen this, Nagisa, said Ray. And that's something else. Ray's passive AT field extends over four kilometres around and over Tokyo 3. If he can sneak into the city with that... Even the Magi's detection system is less reliable, Maya had to admit. Just the boy evading our attempts. Either you two are that lucky, or he's deliberately letting you spot him. Aye. We know it's possible, she added, with their obvious subject. Shinji could do that too. Being deliberately in view was his best defence when he would need to just stop and disappear. The two agents felt annoyed anyway, as if their competence was in question. They would freely chosen to follow young Ikari. The thought that someone else had such a prodigy was... disturbing, to say the least. You accomplished more just by sitting around and going to Spagol than many others running frantic, said Agent Contero, as if the words pained him to admit. What are you talking about? You're all doing the hard work he replied, quizzical. Please don't think I don't appreciate that. I don't think we don't know that. A good commander knows how to delegate. It's a poor leader of men that tries to be everywhere and do everything all at the same time. He shrugged. Unless you attempt at being God. Then he would be a god of sheep and automatons, Ray put in. Shinji frowned. Reason and faith are not mutually exclusive concepts. A god should only be as powerful as its people giving strength instead of taking it, and that ray triumphs in all the ways. Absolute unrewarding obedience was what led to ruin in the years after impact, the elder continued. <laughs> Religions or state, crusade or living space, it doesn't matter. They sacrifice their people either way. Why are we talking about this? asked the younger. That's how we in the service operate too. Orders aren't meant to be questioned. <laughs> least here we know why. Kid, after all my years, you can't imagine just how freeing that is. He had lost everything. 
his family, his identity, even his own ideals after impact. Working for the boy was vastly more satisfying than scheming for his father. Even if we can't follow Nagisa, we already know all the SEAL plans in this city. I have confirmed their subject, Shinji-kun, said Ray. For those who had no actual malicious intent and were just being manipulated by the old man, there was Maya's magic. Good. Shinji-kun! Yes? Maya looking so shy. It was especially endearing, even more in her brazen outfit. What's wrong? She shook her head. Nothing's wrong, she huffed out. That's the problem. Maya explained that she was nearly caught with unauthorised use of the magi only once. Ritsuko had noticed the odd processing rates of the system, despite being given what seemed to be basic tasks. A lot of processing power was being directed to external monitoring, which was supposed to have a battery of secondary computing systems. There are active scripts leading everywhere, but the idea of the magi being infected by a virus of some form without her knowing about it was ludicrous. The system was supposed to be self-maintaining. That was the most likely cause like a cancerous growth in digital form. So she decided to tighten up the system. The scientists cleared most of all Maya's carefully placed work, excused as garbage processes. I see. How much control of the Magi do you still have? Maya looked up, her face confused. That's just it! I have all of it! My outgoing nodes are still there! They're just completely invisible to the system now! Magi's making two self-updating system reports! One to Nerve and the other to my external terminal. Even its own hardware gauges are spoofed. I can get away with nearly anything now. That's good, isn't it? He asked, confused too. You don't understand. It's not supposed to be possible. That goes deep in the core programming, and even that is an open Aritsuko Senpai. It's writing itself. It's even optimizing my own grafted codes. Sometimes I don't even have to type my password anymore. The interface just vanishes afterwards and complied when I need it. She winced. I don't really believe all this machine spirit business, but apparently the magic can distinguish between me and Ritsuko. And that just scares me. Have you been spending more than the maximum recommended two hours in the presence of Assistant Ada? Asked Ray. Wait, are you saying the magic is now sentient? Shinji asked. Oh, now that's just bad news. Asian Jiro had to pull in. How long do you think it would be before that super intelligent machine brain decides it's such a good idea to kill us all? Free brains. Free laws, kid. Ray moved forward and clasped both Shinji and Mai's hands. This is something that is easy to prove, she said, and followed the connections to their spirit. Interestingly, there was indeed a similar feel to the Magi, identical to how she perceived the four lifeless plastic figures that proved so important to Shinji Ikari. It knows, Sister Ibuki, but is not aware. The Magi's biological system is akin to the Ava. It is not too far-fetched. At least they already have their own names. Ghost in the shell, Agent Jiro muttered back. So what does this mean for us? continued the other. For a moment there, Shinji had a silly vision of the Magi, three wise men, preaching and converting computing machines all over the world into some form of omni-faith. Maya shifted in her position to sit for me, in Caesar. From an inner pocket, she took out a flat plastic card and presented it to them. She bowed low, touching her forehead to the ground while pushing it upwards. Look! She said excitedly, despite the puzz. Look at this! Have you ever seen one like this? This is a way better present than chocolate! It's sweeter than pure sugar! Well, yes I have. It's a master account keycard. What's special about this one? It was used when a certain amount was spread over hundreds of other smaller dummy accounts and the total used as a working statement. Only a select few computers were agile enough to handle that supposed trace-proof pattern of shifting access and wash dumping. Maya sat back up and grinned as he took and inspected it. I thought you might want to see what one billion US dollars looked like. Everyone paused and measured Maya's cheerfulness. Agent Jiro put down a dollop of jam back into the bottle. You're joking, right? It's a trick, he said, laughing his own fire and laughing. A billion dollars doesn't actually look like anything. That kind of money doesn't exist. There aren't enough bills in any one place to let you see. And its electronic existence is invisible and intangible. Agent Kentaro just sighed. I vow to myself never to be surprised by anything that happens while under his service, gesturing to Shinji with his spoon.
The agents had to help in eating the chocolate. She's kidding, right? Agent Jira asked. That's not possible. Sentient sci-fi supercomputers he could deal with. That, not so much. Europe had the most intact power plants and industries after impact, but the common euro currency had not had the time to stabilise that time around. Each nation fought to shore up their economy. The dollar rate retained its status as an international measuring stick, if simply because the US was still a producer of so much surplus food, so needed then by the rest of the world. The continental divide didn't help matters any. What with the UK seizing land in northern France, mob uprising of all sorts in the Russian Federation while diverting so much food and resources to fighting off a desperate, starving China, and a rapid deconstruction of all peace in all nations south of Turkey. Nuclear fire kissed the lands for the first time in 50 years. Maya was grinning. Everyone else turned from her to stare flatly at him. The Section 2 operative's eyes bulged. He took a deep breath. Are you... Are you serious? Are you saying you actually have one billion dollars? I don't. It's for shinji -kun. Maya felt along her sides in a sinuous motion that had the men springing to attention. She flicked out with her open hand, turned that palm over, and like a magician spread multicoloured plastic cards onto the play cloth. And he has six! God damn, breathed Agent Kentaro. Okay, I'm surprised. What the fuck? Six billion? How did you pull that off? The younger agent then turned to Shinji and frowned. You're not surprised. Why aren't you surprised? This is six billion dollars here, man. That's six followed by nine zeros. A thousand's already too much for me, Shinji replied calmly. This much for myself I'll never end up using. So I take it you were able to trace a seal account. The money was incidental. How much do they already own of in his again? Wealth was not his own measure of power. Like a sword, worthless until put to use. Do you know the identity of seal? One of them at least. The others are still uncertain, but there are a few more leads. Who? Names are meaningless here, Ray put in. The who is unimportant, for man recreates the self to suit himself. Lies may have the same consistency as truth. Ah, better question then. Rare and when? Maya groaned out. Paris, right now. The Magi was stretching its influence. The other Magi-class supercomputers had less external capabilities, but each locally could crunch through a bevy of uh, aliases and false information. That's the bastard poking around in Tokyo 3. I've had enough of him making my nights more difficult. Shinji sighed. He put his plate down and turned aside. Do you need it to be in order? The Section 2 agents, and his first link to an expanding network of illicit knowledge and immoral dealings, nodded. Maya looked pensive. Ray sat in total acceptance. He sighed. Such simple words. But it would change everything. Him, the others. The line he saw, once he crossed that, he could no longer turn back. He would be willingly walking into hell, showering in sin. I'm no god, thought Shinji, nor a force of good to bring peace into the world. I am at best the sword to separate the wicked from the innocent. A shield against the worst that sought to destroy man. Then hear my command. Send the assassins. Plant the evidence. All the things we talked about before. Let it be done. He sighed again. Begin the purge. Protect my city. The next day, material arrived in Tokyo 3.